crazy is I don't even have sub alerts set up normally. So this is actually just a win for me. Um, and now we're going to go. Oh, remember the, yeah, remember they used to have a sound notification? <laughs> it was like, bring. And I was playing something and it was just like, bring, bring, bring. Uh, okay. Brand alerts live. We're good on those. We are also good on opening up our first video. And then I'll put live the, the social post. Mm, 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 mm. Hey, Factor in chat. If you want to check out Factor, uh, get smarter. Discord. Let's see what we got. So, chat, if you had to choose one of these videos. Ooh, this one looks cool. God Gamers, how Hollow Knight speedrunners beat the perfect run. One of the best speedrun teams I've ever seen on God. Super engaging. This seems kind of hype. Fireborn? All right, we can check this out. We'll kick off with that video because that's fun. That seems fun. Um, I have actually seen the first one minute of this video. I don't know why, but I it just it already auto played, so I think I have seen the beginning of this. I don't know when I watched it, but um, so I'll let you guys watch the first minute, and I will um, set up this post, and then we'll join in together. Two minutes and 29.9 seconds. That was all the time it took for Monstellar to finish Path of Pain, Hollow Knight's hardest platforming challenge. Not as fast as In me, case but... you don't know, Monstellar was the king of Hollow Knight speedrunning. Since the game's release, he achieved over 60 world records, many of which were in the game's most competitive categories. In one 12% all good. Pantheon bosses, he even achieved a personal best over 10 minutes ahead of second place. It was one of the most dominant <laughs> world <is> records <laughs> ever set in the game. So when he said perfect after finishing his run, it was a big deal deal. While everyone knew the well, run would get perfect. paced eventually, no one expected it would today stand nearly 30 seconds behind the world record. In the years following you his rarely run, see a speedrunner the speedrunner say perfect community after a run. drastically changed. Players mastered the Path of Pain speedrun to a level unseen in other Hollow Knight categories, sinking thousands of hours into a challenge lasting only minutes. Over time, Path of Pain became the most difficult, punishing, and fastest Hollow Knight speedrun without question. In this video, I'll tell you the stories of these players. I'll detail the barriers broken, the rivalries, the discoveries, the awe-inspiring achievements, and the gut-wrenching losses. This is the world record history of Path of Pain speedruns. Okay, what did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss? Because this is probably. But before we talk about Monstellar's world record, I want to tell you about the world's first Goomba simulator. Wunderling DX is a non stop puzzle platformer where you play you as a Goomba who intro? runs on its own. The game. No, no, no. You guys missed the chance to not watch it twice. <laughs> no, this is where I stopped. I saw this. I saw this. I saw this. <laughs> I saw this. I've seen this part. 
Okay, actually, this is where I stopped. This is, actually, this is literally where I stopped. Okay, so we're good. But before we talk about Monstellaire's world record, I want to tell you about the world's first Goomba simulator. Wunderling DX is a non-stop okay. puzzle platformer where you play as a Goomba. That is awesome. You're with as we look through each player's run. Goomba. Before we start, however, something important to note Half is the that in Hollow Knight, was moving awesome. hazards such as saw blades and spears function on a cycle beginning when the player enters the room. This means that all the movement in a room leading up to these hazards determines where they'll be when the player reaches them. Because of this, Path of Pain speedrun strategies allow almost no room for major mistakes. Mistakes of any kind can throw off a player's movement through the entire rest of the room. Mm. Monstellar's run starts with a crystal dash into the first room, then rapidly climbing while evading saw blades. Reaching the thorn-filled section of wing molds, he performed a precise dash, Ooh. making use of an intentional shortcut, then descended past the large saw blade. I skipped that shortcut to increase a sigma, the speed of his fall and went the long way to make it harder on myself. Called an inventory drop. Inventory dropping is as simple as opening the inventory while midair. It's a trick that removes the player's fall speed cap, allowing them to fall significantly faster. <laughs> it also cancels the landing stun normally caused by falling a far distance. Interesting. Following this, Monstler crystal dashed to the left and made his ascent to the second room. Monsta made quick work of the first half of room two. The earlier sections of the room don't see much optimization because no matter how fast the player is, this saw blade at the halfway mark will block their path. Monsta pogoed his way through the section filled with stationary saw blades and reached the final part of room two. In this section, most players climbed the left wall and crystal dashed off the top, but Monstellar knew the Sawblade cycle well enough to simply dash oh. through its path and then proceed underneath. Next, Monsta crystal dashed into the third room. By canceling it at a specific timing and pogoing off the Sawblade, oh. he was able to get just enough height to skip straight to the upper wall. He also skipped the left section of the climb by performing a second precise I did this. pogo on another I did this. moving I did this. Blade. But when Monster they call it the intro skip nowadays. The section, he did the unexpected. He crystal well, the from the highest part of the wall, double jumped, and used a fish shriek to stall himself in the air. As he did, a saw blade on his right snuck just far enough down for him to pogo off so of, then. allowing him to skip a portion of the upper room. He proceeded through the tunnel of saw blades and thorns on his left and entered the fourth and final room. At the start, he used a precise crystal dash off the left wall. Too high and he would hit the ceiling, ending the crystal dash. Too low and he would clip the thorns ahead. After, he double jumped into and slowly slid down the next wall. The slight pause enabled him to navigate the saw blades for the rest of the room without stopping even once. The inventory dropped to the two king's molds defending the exit using a strategy of slashing and casting fluke nest twice on each. Oh my god. On the right king's <laughs> mold, he intentionally damage tanked rather than avoiding Why? the hit. He crystal dashed through the gate and started the final cutscene. And with that, Monstellar earned the world's first Path of Pain world record. Monsta's personal best was ahead of its time. It went uncontested for nearly a whole year. <laughs> but in that year, the Hollow Knight speedrunning community was changing. Players were becoming more and more skilled at the game. Bro, being a year ahead is fucking crazy. In a game as popular as this, that that's so pioneering. Because Hollow Knight has a big speedrunning community already, so... Game. In late 2018, a player by the name of DL Karosh began doing runs. Karosh had earned solid times in a few categories, so everyone knew he had the experience to compete. But no one expected him to beat Monstellar's time by 13 seconds. What does he do different? 
One of Karush's biggest optimizations was his use of the Sharp Shadow charm. Sharp Shadow grants the player's Shade Cloak damage and 39% more distance on each dash. This meant that Karush and future players had to map out where to use each and every Shade Cloak dash in the run to maximize the benefit from the charm. Karush's first two rooms were similar to Monsta's, but Sharp Shadow is a double-edged sword. While it generally saved time, when Karosh inventory dropped onto the statue, for example, he had to move left for just a brief moment, as the extra dash distance would have otherwise sent him into the thorns. Similarly, in the second room, Karosh was forced to intentionally waste his shade cloak, as this spot didn't have enough space to accommodate a sharp shadow dash. Karosh's movement was crisp. When he touched a wall to regain his dash and double jump, he would instantly tap away to end the wall cling state and begin falling slightly sooner. After performing a pogo, Karosh would also tap in the opposite direction to cancel the nail swing animation. Because the player can't double jump while the nail animation is active, this allowed him to double jump slightly. Isn't it crazy that I did all of this stuff without learning any of it? You know what I'm saying? It just like came naturally to me. Like every single thing I did in Hollow Knight was all of this, but ahead of its time and first and better. And I did it like without learning it from anybody. That's kind of crazy, right? Isn't that wild? Sooner. Nigh unbelievable. By the end of the second room, he was already 2.74 seconds ahead of Monstellar's world record. In the third room, Karosh didn't use Monsta's Crystal Nash in the upper section. Despite how creative the movement was, it actually lost time. But Karosh's biggest time save was in the fourth room. He developed a new movement strategy for the entire room, oh, saving a new route? full six seconds. It started with dashing through the spears as they retracted into the thorns. With this setup, he was able to perform far more dashes throughout the room. By the end, his movement cycle enabled him to complete the most difficult section in the room without pausing for even a frame. This strategy became the standard for Path of Pain in the years to follow, and it allowed Karosh to achieve a new world record of 2 minutes and 17.09 seconds. Bog. This time save symbolized how much more competitive the speedrunning community had become over the course of 2018. But Monstellar had improved more than anyone, and he was about to prove it. When he came back? In I early 2019, Bro, after performing one that. of the biggest sweeps of the Hollow Knight leaderboards ever, Monstellar <laughs> made his return to Path of Pain. In June, he adopted many of Karosh's strategies, but also sprinkled in a few new ones of his own. In the first room, for example, Monstellar implemented a pogo instant dash on the wing mold leading to the thorn shortcut. This was much harder to execute because being so close to the wing mold meant risking getting hit but it meant he didn't have to wait after the pogo interesting to fall back down. because of the time save he reached the vertical saw blade while it was still at the bottom <laughs> it seemed like it would block his progress but he found that with extremely precise positioning he could actually squeeze perfectly oh! between the two saw blades after that's gangster he cut his crystal dash past the statue short double jumping to begin moving upward slightly early. Smart. In the first room alone, Monstellar saved 1.62 seconds. That's it? In the final section of room two, Monstellar was also able to squeeze this in so an optimized. extra dash, hugging off the bottom left saw blade, the center saw blades, and the top saw blade as it moved to the right, saving 1.16 seconds. Similarly, he discovered faster movement for the upper section of room 3. He double jumped up to the same wing mold as Karosh, but rather than pogoing it and double jumping to the next one, he pogoed it and immediately dashed to the moving saw blade. The additional dash saved 0.65 seconds for the room, but he actually <laughs> had one more trick up his sleeve. After Damn, bro. You know, in a Hitman, that's one thing I'll say about Hitman that I... <laughs> You don't even have points of a second. You know, it's everything is only measured in one second. If it's point six faster, it might as well not be faster. Dude. <laughs> it, it's got to be one second faster or bust.
Killing the left King's Mold, he waited slightly before dashing to the right. He was able to dash straight through the enemy, meaning he dealt damage to it and suffered no freeze frames from damage tanking. Oh. Overall, Monstler saved 3.71 seconds on Kurosh's world record, ending with a time of 2 minutes and 13.38 seconds. Monsta took the world record back, but it would be his last run in the category. Following this, he focused on full game categories in the Pantheons. His achievements, however, would continue to inspire so many others clean to try as fuck. the category Hi, YouTube, themselves. YouTube, that was so clean. But what came that next was, clean. was something few expected. A contender who opted not to use the most important charm in the run. The charm was Dash Master, which reduces the cooldown of the dash from 0.6 to 0.4 seconds. Ironically, many speedrunners despised using it, as its awkward down dash mechanic often sent them face first into the nearest saw blade. For a personal challenge, Axe to You wanted to achieve the world record without using the charm. It was definitely doable <laughs> for shot. him. He was a player who <laughs> arguably had the best understanding of the game's movement out of anyone. Axe discovered several time saves for the run. It started with how he navigated around the first vertical saw blade. Axe pogoed the saw blade and moved to the right wall, performing three wall jumps above it. Previously, players performed a double jump here, mm -hmm. but double jumps in Hollow Knight have a delayed activation, meaning you fall for a brief moment before the double jump actually activates. Right. This means that wall jumps are slightly faster to perform than double jumps. But in the run, when Axe reached the statue, he made a mistake, accidentally canceling the inventory drop too soon. As a result, he exited the room a third of a second behind the world record. Throughout okay. the second room, however, he kept pace with Monsta, entering the third room without bleeding any more time. That's crazy. He used a different Flawless. strategy for the Thorn Tunnel at the end of room three. Similar to Monsta's pogo instant dash off the wing mold in room one, Axe used a strategy of waiting until he had fell far enough down that he could pogo the saw blade and then instantly dash. This oh. was risky because he had to fall very close to the saw blade. Yeah, no joke. Pogo, but it saved a significant <laughs> amount of time. Suddenly, Axe was entering the final room tied with the world record to the frame. Max That's didn't insane. have Dash Master, so theoretically he should have lost time in the fourth room, but he yeah. still managed to pull off Karosh's fourth room movement. Up to the King's Molds, his fourth room was flawless. It was down to the wire. Axe charged his Crystal Dash, but he ended it just a moment <laughs> too soon, meaning he had to walk to begin the final cutscene. His time to beat was 2 minutes and 13.38 seconds. But he still got the world record? After eight months, a new world record had finally been set. When he choked the end and still got the world record, I thought he was tied all the way through. Where did he gave time? Where did he gain time? Beating Monstler's personal best by point the last area, seconds. I seconds. Axe accomplished his goal of obtaining the world record without Dash Master. But while he was grinding these runs, a player who almost no one knew was climbing the leaderboard. The famous stool. <laughs> what is this guy's overlay? <laughs> Something many don't know is that Hollow Knight actually has a significant following in China. Due to censorship laws, however, Chinese players can't access Discord and Google, making communication with the English-speaking community a significant challenge. And that isn't even taking into account Billy, Billy, the baby. language barrier itself. As a result, few Chinese players ever attempted to learn the speedruns which were popular amongst the English-speaking crowd. Stool was a player who- I mean, this is true in Hitman too. You'll find some of the craziest strats coming out of China. If you just spend some time on the Hitman section of Billy Billy, they're, they're not always the fastest, but they're often the craziest. 
who didn't let that Billy get Billy is like Chinese Twitch. His story started in November of 2019 when he published his first Path of Pain run on Billy Billy with a time of 2 minutes and 21 seconds. He was fourth place, just seconds behind Monsta, Axe, and Kurosh. In December 2019, a month later, he improved his personal best to a time of 2 minutes and 16 seconds, knocking Kurosh out of the top three. And Jeez. on January 31st, Stool posted a 2 minute and 13 second run, just a fraction of a second behind the world record. Stool mm. was a player with minimal speedrunning experience. What separated him from the others was his dedication to the run. At this point, Stool had already that. spent months on the category. In February 2020, one month after Axe to Use World Record, Stool posted a new personal best. It was the world's first 2 minute and 12 second run. And there was something subtle about the run which made it stand out. Other players generally save time by implementing new strategies into their runs, but Stool hardly used anything new at all. He <laughs> saved a third of a second in each of the first three rooms. <laughs> the way you set that up was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he plays better. No, I get it. I mean, it's so it's just funny. It's like, what was unique about Stool was that he used nothing new at all. <laughs> just by executing the movement strategies that everyone else already used faster than they did. With this run, Stool proved his insane skill at the category, and he held the world record for months. But on June 26, 2020, a huge discovery was How made. How was he standing there? In Hollow Knight, there are spots where ground hitboxes oh. actually peak above the hitboxes of the thorns, meaning the player can find extremely precise spots to land inside the thorns. One what? of these spots was discovered, which seemed oh intriguing. Oh my god! In room three, and it was quickly confirmed possible to pogo the saw blade and double jump all the way up to the thorns, Whoa. allowing the player to skip the entire right section of the third room. It saved approximately three seconds. It was the biggest skip ever found in Path of Pain speedrunning. We called it Thorn Skip. The Ooh. problem was that it's insanely difficult to pull off. It was more Taco. precise than any other trick used in Hollow Knight speedrunning. But Looks unbeknownst crazy. to them, like one, as the one English pixel, right? community celebrated the discovery, Stool revealed he had independently discovered the skip months earlier. <laughs> he knew the world record could be improved by seconds <laughs> if someone could pull it off in a run. But no one was volunteering to Good try. Job. Months passed and nothing happened. But on October 14th, 2020, Stool posted a new personal Damn, pass, he did it? Two minutes and 9.89 seconds. In the run, Stool completed the first two rooms almost flawlessly, tying his personal best to the tenth of a second. And when he reached the third room, Stool pogoed the saw blade, dashed, and landed Oh, he does it! Thorns. He was finishing a run with Thorn Skip, a feat which would change the category forever. Yeah, now you have to do it. <laughs> oh, he died. Unfortunately, <laughs> Stool's mistake cost him half a second, and his shakiness uh... continued into the fourth room where he lost another quarter of a second. But the run was still more than enough. Damn, you lost a quarter of a second? Shaky, dude. Shaky. <laughs> a quarter of a second? Are you a fucking turtle? Are you trying to crawl over the finish line? <laughs> My God, are you even trying? Are you like Oonga Boonga in your keyboard? A quarter of a second? You know, I might fall asleep watching that. It's so fucking slow. To break a huge <laughs> barrier, Stool achieved the world's first sub 210 Path of Pain run and completed the first run ever using Thorn Skip. Anyone who wanted the world record from this point on had no choice but to perform it as well. With his run, Stool brought Path of Pain speedrunning to another level. Yeah, it's crazy. When Thornskip was first discovered, most speedrunners were hesitant to give it a shot. After all, imagine spending hours doing runs just to have them all end in the oh. exact same spot. Oh. But once players saw Stool was able to pull it off, 
it actually began to have the opposite effect. A new Hollow Knight speedrunner named- Well, no, that's how it always works. There's like a new, harder mechanical version. And everyone's like, oh, I don't know. The old way is kind of better. <laughs> like, I'm more consistent at it. I'd rather just not get the resets. And then someone does it, and it's like, well, now, like, now you kind of have to, or there's no, you have no chance. Kalaski was the first to step forward. Two months after Stool's world record on December 7th, 2020. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like Paris. Like, we knew about the bomb launch forever, but nobody wanted to do it. And then finally someone grounded it to make the fucking consistent version, and then everyone has to do it now. Kalaski made his first submission for Path of Pain. It was a 2 minute and 9.56 second run. He silently grinded nearly 10,000 attempts to complete the run. He was unfortunately lost to a copyright strike, and it was Ooh. never re-uploaded. What? But just two days later, Stool fired back. On December oh. 9th, 2020, Stool did more than just take the world. It'd be so funny if you spent 10,000 attempts and then uploaded the only copy and just put Katy Perry's roar over it or something. <laughs> and it gets struck and lost forever. <laughs> God damn, that's a lot of effort record back he broke another second barrier completing the world's first two minute stool, you're and nuts. Eight second run as was customary with stool the time save was primarily due to better execution he also saved time as expected avoiding the wing mold in room three yeah, no in doubt. the first half of room one however he did use a new strategy before the thorn shortcut, Stool pogoed the first wing mold as early as possible, then double jumped left and dashed Ooh. straight into the thorn tunnel, skipping pogoing the second wing mold completely. This strategy was about as fast as before, but was slightly easier for players to perform. After oh, Stool's run, nice. Kalaski took a short break through the holiday season of 2020. Up to this point, Path of Pain only saw short bursts of activity. But in 2021, twice as many Path of Pain world records were set oh, what? as in all the previous what? years combined. And it began with a flurry was of world home. records set by Kalaski. Kalaski's playstyle and movement strats were inspired. I mean, the lockdowns in China are insane. They're, they're even more, you know, they're, I mean, sometimes we don't even have lockdowns here, but. They're serious in China. Maybe he's just literally sitting there. Hired by Axe more than anyone else. This was because Cal was the only other top player to have similarly opted not to use Dash Master. He consistently lost approximately a fifth of a second in room two, but Cal knew what he was doing. He would regularly save around a quarter of a second over stool in the first room alone. It was because if Cal's first room wasn't absolutely perfect, he would reset, sometimes performing up to a hundred attempts before even reaching the second room. <laughs> Cal's other strength was his room three. It was insanely consistent. In three of his four submitted times, the time he achieved so in his miserable, third room dude. was 20.7 seconds. That's like restarting Paris unless you get a 44. Oh, I just want to throw myself off a fucking bridge. <laughs> oh. He did this by implementing a movement strategy discovered nearly a full year earlier by Axe. Cal was able to leverage these strengths to great success, attaining three world records in a row, achieving a time of 2 minutes and 8.28 seconds. But Cal wanted to finally break a second barrier and achieve the world's first 2 minute and 7 second time. At this point, he had already performed nearly 15,000 attempts and was still a third of a second away. He needed something more to be able to pull it off. And as luck would have it, a new discovery was in the process of being made. Players were previously convinced they had been running Path of Pain on the optimal patch, patch 1221, but the developers had released up to patch 1432. This patch removed inventory dropping, which was a significant time loss, but there was another difference. On 1432, the King's Molds at the end had significantly less health, enabling what? a new quick kill strat. Players could descending dark as far left as possible, and it would just barely hit the left King's Mold with the spell Shockwave. They would then swing at and sharp shadow dash through the King's Mold on the right, shade souling left 
three oh, times, killing them both. both at the same time. Cal started a run on the new patch to test whether it saved time. He was immediately on a great pace. Despite not being able to inventory drop, he only lost a third of a second in room one and even saved time in room two. Okay. Room three, however, started off awkwardly. Cal used a new strat of pogoing the soul statue rather than the oh. saw blade, but hesitated just slightly before doing so. Somehow, Cal still managed to climb quickly enough to reach the saw blade in time to perform thorn skip. He dude, ended I, the third room <laughs> with a time of 20. This is so miserable, dude. Unless that thorn skip is like, I mean, that looks so inconsistent. You have to literally be pixel perfect, right? That looks so miserable. You have to get through all of that in the third room, and then if you just fucking land on the... 0.7 seconds. Cal was only 0.2 seconds behind his personal best with potential time save at the end of room four. He reached the King's Molds with nearly flawless movement and dove into the arena, pulling off the quick kill strategy perfectly. He crystal dashed to the right and finished the run. But was it enough to make up for entering the room behind on time? Cal was looking Pause for chip. the sub two minute and eight second Pause run. Pause chip. Pause chip. Pause chip. Pause chip. Oh! <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Finally did it. After months of grinding and nearly 15,000 attempts, Cal broke his first second barrier. As a result, patch 1432 became the new standard for Path of Pain speedruns. Content with his achievements, Cal moved on to other speedrunning categories, and with Stool and Kalaski out of the picture, a new player began their rise to the top. Two weeks before Kalaski's run, on January 14th, 2021, a player named Shy posted a Path of Pain personal best of 2 minutes and 22 seconds. It was their first submitted speedrun ever. But what was impressive Wait, what? about this run was that Shy had already begun using top level strategies, such as Karosh's fourth room movement cycle. On February 3rd, Shy posted another personal best. This time, a 2 minute and 13 second run using Thorn Skip. It was a trick that only two players had ever pulled off in a run. Shy practiced the room for 8 hours before pulling it off even oh, a shit. single time, and continued for dozens more hours before becoming consistent enough to use it in runs. Shy was set on becoming a top Path of Pain speedrunner. Throughout February, Shy rapidly improved, setting new personal bests on February 8th with a 2.12 and on February 12th with a 2 minute and 8 second run. In just a month, Shy was already just 1 second behind the world record. But Shy was a player who wasn't just focused on execution. Shy developed and implemented more new He's strategies both? for the run than anyone else. For example, in the second room at the statue, Shy found it was marginally faster if you performed a precise dash along the ground, avoiding a needless double jump by performing a grounded jump instead. Shy also found a time save in the top section of room 2. Previously, players would start their dash from far left so that as it ended, they were in position to pogo the bottom left saw blade. Shy discovered that you could instead start moving right as soon as possible and pogo the bottom left saw blade slightly later instead. Naturally, this saved a significant amount of time. Shy found an even bigger time save at the end of the third room. Before this, players would pogo above these wing molds to avoid them. Shy instead delayed their dash slightly to intentionally expend their Shade Cloak after the first wing mold. This meant that Shade Cloak would refresh and get used here, and then refresh again at the perfect time to dash directly through the final wing mold in the section. For those who were paying attention, it was no surprise when Shy set a new world record on February 26th. It was with a time of 2 minutes and 7.59 seconds. 0.16 seconds faster than Kalaski's time. What was a surprise was that just four days later, Shy was about to do it again. 
In the four days the time span, Chai had already begun using a new strategy. It was called a Cyclone Drop. Using Cyclone Slash during Whoa. a drop temporarily uncaps the player's fall speed, similar to inventory <laughs> dropping. However, it's rarely optimal to use because it only uncaps fall speed for a small amount of time. But this made it perfect for the statue drop in room 1, where the right. stun from Descending Dark wasted too much time. Despite its simplicity, the strategy saved half a second. Because of this, Shy was able to find a pace. Developers are probably pissed people keep finding ways to uncap their fall speed. Pace half a second ahead of world record entering room 3. And while Kalaski's 20.7 second third room was incredible for its time, Shy's third room clocked in at 20.34 seconds, over a third of a second faster than Cal. It was a significantly faster time than what anyone had pulled off before. Shy was on pace for a new world record, but when they went to Shade Soul the King's Mold at the end, they mistimed their second oh. input, pressing it too early and losing a significant amount of time. The time to beat was 2 minutes and 7.59 seconds. Yeah. Despite the mistake, Still? Shy broke their first second barrier, achieving the world's first 2 minute and 6 second Path of Pain speedrun. Breaking a second barrier in this category was a huge Did achievement, that? something Kalaski performed nearly 15,000 attempts to pull off. But Shy wasn't content with just that. Just a few days later, after having set two world records in a row, Shy discovered a new cycle for Room 4, replacing DL Karosh's cycle that had been used for over two years. Previously, hmm. players would pogo dash once off the center spear and then once on the vertical saw blade after. With the new cycle, Shy squeezed in an extra pogo dash off the right spear as well. Shy would then wait for Shade Cloak to refresh this before so insanely dashing optimized. off this saw blade. With this movement, Shy reached the final saw blade significantly sooner, and just as they did, Shade Cloak refreshed. This saw blade would then oh! return, following right behind the player, allowing them to rapidly pogo dash off of it three times in a row. This yeah, was Shy's faster. new fourth room cycle. They have my the approval biggest path to use of that. Discovery it's faster. Since Thorn Skip. The cycle wasn't easy to pull off either, but just five days after the previous world record, Shy entered room four, tied with their personal best, and pulled off the new movement cycle successfully. Everyone knew it would be a new world record, but would it be the world's first two minute the and five cycle second if you run? Will, yeah. Five seconds! <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, holy shit. In the span of one week, Shy broke not just one, but two second barriers. It was the craziest string of world Damn, records breaking yet. Your own record. Players named the fourth room movement cycle the Shykel. Shy had made so many new discoveries and pushed the world record down faster than anyone could have ever expected. Following this, for the first time in 2021, there was a lull in the action, but this only gave a new player the time they needed to catch up. Shortly after Shy's world records, a player named VLS began doing runs. In his first run, he took 11 hits of unintentional damage, taking over 4 minutes to finish. The video was titled, Trying to Speedrun Path of Pain, but I'm not a Path of Pain <laughs> speedrunner. Over the next week, he would rapidly improve, completing his first hitless run with a time of 2 minutes and 39 seconds on April 5th. He took a short Grinder, break before record. continuing in May, returning with another streak of personal bests. By June, he had improved to a time of 2 minutes and 13 seconds. On June 22nd, VLS finished his first run with Thorn Skip, achieving a 2 minute and 9.12 second run. He started taking things more seriously than before. Six days well, later, if you're doing VLS thorn skip, you gotta be a already. strategy for room 2, saving approximately half of a second. It was performed by dashing from slightly farther left, allowing him to pogo the bottom left saw blade immediately after the dash. VLS would then pogo the center saw blades on the left, and then pogo the center saw blades again on the right. 
This enabled him to squeeze in an additional dash oh, into yeah, the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of June, VLS narrowly took second place from Kalaski with a time of 2 minutes and 7.51 seconds. But he was still 2 How? seconds behind Shy. I'm sorry, when was his first video? March? March, April, May, June. Dude, that's, July 13th, that's quick to get VLS so good. VLS started another run. His individual room times had become so fast that if the stars aligned, he was capable of skipping the two minute and six second <laughs> run and taking the world record. The guy who said perfect is starting to look like a clown. <laughs> Monster from the beginning? What, what a Third joke, dude. Perfect. Loop. His room one was nearly <laughs> identical to Shy's, but in the second room, he pulled off his new strat, leaping ahead of the world record by almost half a second. After VLS landed Thornskip, the pressure was on. There were signs, however, that the pressure was getting to him. Minor pauses in his movement for safety. As he finished the room, he golded his split. But even though it was a gold, VLS lost 0.4 seconds to Shy. Going into room 4, they were tied with times of 1 minute and 21.2 seconds. VLS couldn't bleed any more time. In room four, at the last moment, VLS second-guessed himself. No! With just a single button press, he missed the cycle and instantly ended his chance of getting the world record. But Sash it was still possible cringe. to earn a personal best. He dove to the king's molds, dashed to the right, and cast only two shade souls. Oh, he didn't nerves. start the run with enough soul to cast nerves. three. His run ended a quarter <laughs> of a second behind his personal best. That's still but a 207 after all those? more attempts, VLS earned the two minute and six second time. In the run, there was still some shakiness after he landed Thornskip, with a delayed jump into room four and missing the triple pogo dash at the end of the shikel. But apart from these mistakes, the run was almost perfect. VLS was only a second away from earning the world record, but the only way he could pull it off is by overcoming his third and fourth room nerves. 6,000 attempts later, he <laughs> entered room three, outpacing his best time by 0 0.07 seconds. Holy fuck. It was a huge opportunity. He had a full half second lead on Shy, pulling off Thornskip successfully. But he bled time to Shy's third room, and as he entered the fourth room, he was less than a tenth of a second ahead. Once again, there was no room for mistakes. As he finished the fourth room, it was so close that no one knew if he'd pulled it off. The time to beat was 2 minutes and 5.61 seconds. <laughs> you guys can't see it. Oh no. Oh my god. Oh my god. It was a new world record by less than two frames. After four months of hard work, VLS dethroned Shy's personal best on July 27th. VLS painstakingly went from a four minute time, being hesitant to even call himself a speedrunner, to being the <laughs> fastest Path of Pain speedrunner in the world. That's cool. Cementing himself as one of the That's best really cool. speedrunners of the game. Shy immediately returned to take the record back. Shy's pissed. Over the next week and a half, I Shy heard of the cycle, bro. thousands of attempts. It didn't take them long to get back in the swing of things. On August 4th, Shy started off a run on a great pace, ending the first room with a time of 27.11 seconds. Shy's movement in the second room was a mix of their previous movement and VLS's new movement. It was slightly faster than before, but not quite as fast as VLS. But mm. as Shy entered the third room, it was their time to shine. Shy pulled off Thornskip and approached the tunnel to exit the room. But at the end of the tunnel, Shy pogoed too early, bonking into the ceiling without gaining any height. You fool! Shy had no choice but to pogo the final wing mold to enter the fourth room. Shy was a quarter of a second behind. In order to pull it off, Shy would need better than a 44.22 second fourth room. But Shy absolutely flew through room four, completing it nearly flawlessly. There was no doubt that it beat VLS's room four time, but was it enough to get the world record back? The time to beat was two minutes and 5.58 seconds.
Shai's run resulted in the only frame tie to the hundredth of a second in the history That's of all Hollow Knight speedrunning. As a result, That's Shai crazy. went back to the drawing boards. In room two after the statue, Shai started using a, a frame new wall jump on the right rather than two wall jumps and a double jump. It put them in the perfect spot to use four dashes in quick succession. Shai also fully implemented VLS's movement in the final part of the room. Finally, and most importantly, Shai began using the turnaround thorn skip. Mm. It was an even more difficult version of the skip. It involved double jumping first and dashing almost directly onto the thorns. Immediately after the dash, the player would turn around just a moment before landing oh. and dash twice instantly after. It saved about a third of a second, but it was an absurdly difficult oh, skip so, to pull that looks off so not run. fun to do. In late August, Shy started a run. They finished the first room with an excellent time of 27.02 seconds. And thanks to their movement optimizations in room two, Shy finished it with a 32.8 second time. This was the fastest pace entering room three ever achieved by a player. And when they reached it, they pulled off the turnaround thorn mm -hmm. skip. They finished room three 1.48 seconds ahead of the world record. That's crazy. The run was on pace to break two second barriers at once, skipping the two minute and four second run to earn the world's first two minute and three second world record. But Shy was just a few pixels too no! low, and the pace was gone in an instant. After the run, Shy revealed they were only able to complete the turnaround thorn skip twice in a run ever, out of approximately a. <laughs> Bro, that's so depressing. That that does not sound fun at all. You got, you, I I respect it, but I also like, holy shit, what a what a grind thousand runs that had reached the skip. It was a success rate of 0.2% from the player with the best room three in the world. Shy took a step back from attempts and in their place, a familiar face returned. Stool was making his return to the category. It was October. I should show Ari this. <laughs> I should show this and be like, look at this. <laughs> It could be worse, babe. I could have gotten into Hollow Knight speedrunning. 2021, a couple months after Shy tied BLS's run to the frame. Stool saw all the new strategies that had been developed since then and realized the record was ripe for the taking. His personal best was a time of 2 minutes and 8.84 seconds set in December 2020 over three seconds away from the current world record. But Stool's strength as a player was his execution. Mm -hmm. And if he could master the strategies that others had found, the world record would be his. On October 5th, Stool posted a run. His attempts counter was still under a thousand, but he was pulling off Giga all Shad. the new movement successfully. Even in the first room, Stool saved time without any significant differences in strategy. It was all in the smallest of details, saving milliseconds wherever possible. Stool's first room was on the same level as Cal's, but he used all of the new time saves. He exited the room a full third of a second ahead of the world record, but he wouldn't slow down in room two. VLS's room two was the fastest ever done in a world record by a quarter of a second, but Stool finished the room even faster with a sub 33 second time. As Stool entered room three, he was tied with Shy's insane pace from before to the frame. Stool reached Thorn Skip and pulled it off successfully, reaching the King's Molds at the end of room four shortly after. This was the only moment where Stool showed any sloppiness. His fireballs were just slightly too late and he lost a bit of time to the King's Molds. <laughs> Regardless, with the run, Stool finally made his return to the top of the Path of Pain leaderboards. It was the world's first two minute and four second run, but King Stool Ship. knew that he was capable of even better. Just of course he did. three days later, on October 8th, 
Stool posted another personal best. His run used the same strategies as before, but in every room, he saved time. His skill <laughs> was on another level. In That's the crazy. third room, Stool implemented a wing mold skip that Shy had found, double jumping directly to the leftmost wing mold, saving approximately a quarter of a second. His room three matched Shy's best room three in a run to the frame. Stool was on pace to earn the world's first two minute and three second path of pain run ever done, just days after he had already broken a second barrier. But when he it, went to the King's Molds, he made the same mistake again and lost Cringe. a few frames. He wasn't clear whether he could pull it off. Stool set a new personal best, a run just frames away from being the world's first 2 minute and 3 second run. Second barrier broken or not, he finished the unbelievable run which Shy had lost before, and he proved that the 2 minute and 3 second run was within reach Definitely for possible. a human player. Stool decided to stop there, right now. content with the progress that he'd made. Stool was not an innovator, but with his precise and consistent execution, he once again took the run to another level. At this point in time, yeah, I'll this up too right now. Become no so optimized that top runners were either veterans of the category, such as Stool, or players who had spent months catching up. Yet just two days after Stool set the world record, a new player took it from him. Iho was a Chinese player who burst onto the Hollow Knight scene. Known for setting a new any percent no major glitches current patch world record earlier in 2021. But Iho was now running Path of Pain as he posted a new time of 2 minutes and 3.59 seconds. The world's first 2 Out of minute nowhere? And 3 second run. Iho's room times looked like this. He wasn't able to match Stool's room 1, but in room 2, he saved nearly half a second. This was because Iho optimized the climb to the upper section of room 2. The movement was incredibly crisp. He would dash just pixels underneath mm. the thorns, proceeding upward with a double jump, pogo, and three wall jumps. This cut out two unnecessary double jumps, and because it was faster, it allowed the player to begin moving right in the next section even earlier. Iho exited the room 0.29 seconds ahead of the world record That's and maintained insane. the lead in room 3. In room 4, however, Iho saved even more time. He pulled off the Shikle and King's Mold quick kill without any time loss. It was a run that seemed nearly flawless, but one player in particular <laughs> would be inspired to beat it. Shy's coming had back! already cemented themselves as one of the best Path of Pain speedrunners of all time. He Even though Shy was in third place at this point, they had innovated and contributed so much to the run. More than anyone else, Shy paved the way for the community's progress in 2021. And to discover what strategies to learn next, they looked to the Path of Pain tasks. Path of Pain has mm. sections which are highly you mean my video. In the community, they call my runs of it the Path of Pain Tass. It's like a fun little in-joke because I run it so computer-like and, uh, <laughs> and, and quick. Room 1, however, was the least cycle-dependent They call me the all, human Tass, yeah. But the Path of Pain Tass actually hit a specific cycle involving the large vertical saw blade. The Tass reached it so quickly that it could just barely squeezed to the left by sharp shadow down That's dashing crazy. along the wall. After performing the down dash, what I would the say if I didn't invent far it. enough left that it could bypass the next section without having to break its fall pogoing the saw blade. It saved about a third of a second. The problem was that no player had ever pulled it off in a run. It required <laughs> players to that be is a incredibly <laughs> fast in the first part of the room to reach the saw blade in time. If they were too slow, the saw blade would be too far down and the player wouldn't have enough room to perform the down dash. Mm. But while others were performing world record attempts, Shy was practicing the TAS Room 1 cycle. On October 18th, just six days after Iho's run, Shy posted a run of their own. In it, Shy's best time for Room 1 was visible on Live Split, 26.40 seconds. 
It was a time significantly faster than anything uh, before. Leaked it. <laughs> and sure enough, when Shai reached the saw blade, they were fast enough to pull off the task cycle. What a Shai goat. exited room one with a time of 26.52.31 seconds ahead of Iho's world record. In room two, Shai used Iho's new movement strategies, but wasn't quite as clean as he was, losing 0.13 seconds. But Shy was the master of room three. While they didn't go for the turnaround thorn skip, they didn't need it. With clean execution what? throughout the room, Shy brought their lead back to 0 0.31 seconds. Wow, once didn't again. use it, still got the In lead. In the fourth room, Shy used a different version of the Shikel, which was roughly the same speed. But he as invented Shy a new Shikel? Holds, they made an unfortunate mistake. Shy again performed the fireball input slightly too early. It wasn't clear whether the world record was still possible. The time to beat was 2 minutes and 3.59 seconds. Shy Let's go! beating Iho's time by 0.17 seconds. It took less than a week, but the very next day, Iho began streaming attempts <laughs> to take the world. Bro, this is so brutal. This is so brutal. 10,000, 50,000 attempts. They beat it. They get it for one day, and then someone comes along and grinds another 50,000 attempts. Goddamn. World record back, and he was already pulling off the TAS Room 1 cycle. But even though he could pull it off occasionally, the cycle was insanely hard. His attempts climbed by the thousands as the weeks passed. On November 3rd, Iho pulled off the TAS Room 1 cycle successfully and entered the fourth room 0.16 seconds ahead of the world record. With a flawless room, the two minute and two second time was just barely doable. Iho reached the King's Molds and performed the quick kill without any significant time loss. Everyone knew it was a new world record. Don't show. Would it break the second barrier? Oh, he already did it. He just clutched it. Oh, not it quite. It wasn't the two minute not and quite. two second run, not but quite. it was a huge world record. His only significant time loss was losing 0.19 seconds to Shy's room slow, three. Bad. If Shy <laughs> wanted to take the world record Damn, back, dude, they slow had and some bad. catching up to do. <laughs> Shy began labbing the entire level to try and close the gap, searching for potential time saves anywhere. Soon enough, Shy made a new discovery. Instead of dashing prior to perform, I like Shy. He's an innovator, dude. Based on this video, I mean, sometimes these videos are like, you know, they dramatize it a little bit, but it sounds like Shy's the type of guy who's always thinking of how we do it different, not how I can do the current strategy better. During the thorn skip, Shy squeezed in another pogo on the saw blade to double jump straight up to the thorns. Because they didn't Bay? dash okay. before the skip, they didn't have to wait for Sharp Shadow to refresh. It saved approximately a quarter of a second. Shy attempted runs for weeks without much luck. But on November 22nd, Shy finally had an opportunity. If they could take the world record, they might also be able to claim the world's first two minute and two second run. Shy reached room three. I don't see how they could ever break two without something the world crazy record, new. But pulled off their new movement, saving 0.37 seconds on Iho's run. Iho's room four times, however, were typically slightly faster than Shy's, so it was going to be close. But Shy's room four was flawless, oh! finishing the room with the fastest time ever achieved in a world record at 44.10 wow. seconds. Shy took the world record back with a time of 2 minutes and 2.89 seconds. In case it wasn't already obvious, these players were going to compete for the world record. Yeah, it's when just, Iho returned, rather than simply copying just the new room 3 strategy, he actually improved it. He noticed that when Shy performed the skip, they double jumped straight to the left wing mold as normal and had to pause to avoid dashing into the leftmost vertical saw blade. Right. Instead of doing that, Iho double jumped and paused at the rightmost wing mold. Pausing there allowed Sharp Shadow to refresh at the perfect moment to allow one extra Sharp Shadow dash in the room. It saved about a third of a second. Just two days later, Iho had a run on pace to take the world record back. Because of his new movement, his third room was a gold split, and over half a second ahead of Shy's world record. And he flew through room four, poised to end the run with a low two minute and two second time. Okay. Choke or what?
Oh. Oh, I'd be so much madder than that. He still got it, though. Or is that not the world Despite record? Despite the time loss on December 24th, 2021, he Iho for a bit. earned a new world record by 0.22 seconds. But even though his skill and precision earned himself a spot at the top of the leaderboards, the path that brought him there was paved by so many others. And in early February 2022, Wait, is he the current leader? was going to prove it. On February 2nd, oh, no. okay, 2022, Shai revealed they had implemented another strategy they'd found from the TAS. This time, it was a strategy in Room 3, a strat which Shai said took 3,000 attempts. It takes 3,000 attempts to get it once? Ah! <laughs> to pull off just once. It was a combination That's of so the new miserable. movement Iho found, along with an additional pogo dash. But this time, it was on a saw blade, which was above the player. <laughs> Just days later, Shai posted a run. He'd entered room three using the same movement and strats as before, but they managed to squeeze a small amount of time save on their personal best. In room three, they pulled off the new TAS movement. Crazy. Suddenly, Shai was 0.20 seconds ahead of Iho's world record. With Iho's mistake at the end of room four, Shai had the potential Haunting to save him at this point. even more time in the final room. After an excellent room four, Shai had pulled it off, but they weren't sure by how much. The time to Perfect. beat was two minutes and 2.67 seconds. Low twos? <laughs> the next time we're gonna get to the last room, we're gonna get the fucking world record. Dude. Shy pulled it off, <laughs> achieving an unbelievable time of two minutes. God, this and is 2. such an optimized run. This is literally disgusting. The two minute and one this second time felt so close yet so far. It was a milestone representing an almost completely perfect run with the current strategies. Even combining the best room times achieved out of every world record up to this point, the time was two minutes and 1.96 seconds, giving only a few frames of wiggle room to achieve the sub two minute and two second run. It seemed almost impossible for a player to pull it off, but Iho wouldn't let that get in his way. Two weeks after Shai's run on February 16th, 2022, Iho achieved a new personal best. It was a time of two minutes and 1.90 seconds, the world's first two minute and one second time. In the run, Iho's strategy was identical to Shai's in their previous world record, but his times in room two and room four were unbelievable. Through precise execution alone, Iho incredibly saved 0.15 seconds in room two and 0.26 seconds in room four. With this run, Iho cemented himself as the most technically skilled Path of Pain speedrunner without Ever. question. Ever. And as of the creation of this video, Iho's run was the last world record achieved in the category. After what happened throughout 2021 and early 2022, who knows what's in store for the speedrun in the future? Although the world record's now more optimized than ever before, still holds. The pain, these players still have holds. The sky's the limit. There are still time saves so incredibly difficult that players are yet to introduce them into the run. Which of these strategies will be used? Who will be the next to get the world record? And will the two minute and one second barrier ever be broken? If you want to keep up to date, I've posted links to subscribe to the players below. In conclusion, I'd like to sincerely thank all of them for their permission to make this video and use their footage. I'd also like to shout out Hollow Knight modders whose work enabled players to efficiently practice and- Okay, I'm gonna do a run. Fuck it, I'm gonna do a run. Okay. <clears throat> I think I could beat that. Here we go. Get a little warmed up. Okay. Here we go. Oh, 
little time there. No big deal. Make it back. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, do a little one of these. Call it the Atriox cycle. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Gotta get past this part. Yep. Okay. Scratch my ear a little quick. I can do this one handed. I'm doing this part one handed. <laughs> Alright. And then we'll fix this part. <laughs> uh, holy shit. Holy shit. Well, I'm actually on a pretty good pace so far. Might as well push for the end of it. Skip the thorn part. Didn't even need to do it, I guess. No one ever thought about skipping the thorns. It's like, just... Okay. And... I call this part the easiest part in the game because I, like, always nail it. Boom. No problem. And, all right. Might as well just uh, wrap it up. What was that time, though? A 152? Holy shit. That's right. There's my sponsors, a Rubik's Cube and uh, a different YouTube video. Whoa, 152? Holy shit. Now do it blindfolded? Could. Choose not to. Wow. So I, what did I do? I shaved nine seconds off the world record on my first attempt. <laughs> I'm not even going to upload it. Nah, I won't even upload it. I like those guys. Ehu and, and Shy. Good people. So. Um, they can they can keep battling it out. <sighs> Plus, uh, you know, I only upload um, speed runs when I can put DMC music over them. So if that's not allowed, then I, I'm taking I'm boycotting. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, that was a good video. It was a little long, but it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, you're the bigger man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I stay humble, stay hungry. You know what I'm saying? It's not about always getting the world record. It's about showing that you can on stream and then never uploading it. Uh, let's see what else is, uh, but let's watch a little short. Let's watch a shorter and, uh, maybe more fact-based, um, video next, but I did enjoy that. If you guys don't know what we're doing, we're currently in the middle of Get Smarter Saturday, sponsored by Factor Meals. Right here, you can see them. Delicious, healthy meals delivered straight to your doors and smoothies. Um, you get to pick the boxes that you get delivered. You heat them up in the microwave in two seconds, or two minutes, I'm sorry. And they are uh, delicious and healthy, and uh, I've been eating them pretty much every day after I work out or, or for lunch. Uh, they saved me a ton of money on ordering food, which I was doing all the time. And since I don't cook very often, I have found them to be extremely useful. If you want to try them out, use uh, the expedition weight factor in chat or the factor panel below the stream. And use code POGHTROCK120 for $120 off your first order. Why are you in squad mode? Because I love my dog, Linkus. Now let's see what we got in the subreddit. History of adventure games. How this game controls your heartbeat. Pitch Perfect 237. What, what the fuck is this? What do, you, what do you mean in protest against? <laughs> like, why would you need to be a hidden protester of 9-11? Everybody hates 9-11. It's, it's not like a crazy take. <laughs> Just, you don't have to be underground to protest 9-11. What do you think the odds are that the first competition in the movie would be in New York City? The Treblemakers, the all-male group, they do a choreography of an airplane. Okay. There's a sign in the crowd that says, Acapella is my co-pilot. And the Barden Bellas come out dressed as flight attendants. Okay. So then I went back and I started doing the math. So the Treblemakers come out and they have nine guys. Okay. Nine. 
Remember that number. <laughs> then the Bard and Bellas come out. They have 11 ladies. Yeah, I figured. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I mean, there is so some. There's pitch something perfect here. Perfect is about 9/11. Great. Get in line. But what is Kendrick saying about it? <laughs> Think about the bus trip. No one would make a pro 9-11 movie. Even if we accept your thesis that this is a 9-11 based movie, it would always be anti-9-11. That when the Bellas are um, on their way to the semis and they start singing Miley Cyrus. So it's kind of a great scene in the movie. Everyone's singing Party in the USA and mm -hmm. Becca, who spells her name with one C because she's alternative. Even she's into it. And then they stop singing Party in the USA because their bus runs out of gas. Now, some critics have said this is because Fat Amy forgot to fill it up after being hit <laughs> by a burrito. But it's also because <laughs> there was a party in the USA up until, say, September 10th, 2001, when the Bush administration decided that it was time to get more gas, i.e. oil. <laughs> Earlier in the movie, Chloe overhears Becca singing the song Titanium in the shower. And Becca is surprised that Chloe knows this song. To which Chloe replies, Have I been living under a rock? Living under a rock. <laughs> As Kendrick would spell it, Iraq. So maybe Bush orchestrated 9 11 as a means to invade the Middle East. Or maybe it's the exact opposite. It's See, not, Kendrick don't just flip the map. This idea of symmetry. People don't realize this, but the entire screenplay is a palindrome. That's not true. That's not Kendrick true. He wants us to see something backwards so that we can understand it forwards. Take the song, turn the beat around. So this okay. is a song that the Barden Bellas consistently sing to their own Akka detriment. Mm -hmm. I think what Kendrick's doing here is asking us, nay, telling us to literally <laughs> turn the beat around. Turn beat around and you get Taib or probably Taib. So what does this Taib mean? One Google search later and the first result is Hassan Taib the head of the intelligence bureau for the army of the guardians of the islamic revolution in iran kendrick is waving her arms at us telling us that we have it wrong 9-11 was not perpetrated by the cia if anything it seems like 9-11 was a carefully coordinated attack by muslim extremists known as al-qaeda that's not the that's again, already the commonly the accepted is a Freud, which leads me to you guessed it the mainstream media Okay. <laughs> That's just his ass. Kendrick actually goes to the formal audition. She does this incredible little cup dance while basically being on the ground, ground mm -hmm. zero. But think about <laughs> what fine. song everyone else sings. Uh -huh. Kelly Clarkson's Since You Been Gone. Kelly Clarkson, a.k.a. American Idol. Yes. A.k.a. American Idol, <laughs> a.k.a. We Did Nothing to Stop 9-11. <laughs> but one of the judges on American Idol is Harry Connick Jr. Right. When is his birthday? September fucking 11th. Okay, that's crazy. How long was Harry and the rest of the Connick Juniors working with the Taliban? More on that later. They're not all Connick Juniors. Consider He's Becca's junior. romantic foil, uh, Jesse, played by Skylar Aston with a sort of dashing flamboyance. Mm -hmm. Jesse teaches Becca about the power of film by forcing her to watch The Breakfast Club, mm -hmm. a movie starring Judd Nelson. Take their two names. Skylar Aston Lipstein equals mm -hmm. Judd Asher Nelson. Okay. That equation, after you spend a few hours studying it, is actually an anagram for Lost Planes Range Jihad <laughs> in U.S. Sky <laughs> equals R-S-T-L-N-E. <laughs> Those are the letters that you're not allowed to guess on the bonus round of Wheel of Fortune, which is on ABC, owned by Disney, and is hosted by none other than Pat... Pat Sajak! 
Oh no! Does she think we're stupid? <laughs> Does she think we won't notice? Oh my god, I was stupid. Holy shit. That was powerful. I've seen Pitch Perfect 150 times. I watch it two times every day. Once when I wake up, once I go to bed, and I haven't noticed that. I truly think we all got smarter for that. We truly all got smarter. That was still part of Get Smarter Saturdays. Wow. Wow. So it turns out 9-11 was caused by Muslim extremists this whole time. Thank you, Anna Kendrick, for confirming. <laughs> there was always that shred of doubt, you know? Uh, okay. Um, how about, let's find another video. Cicada 3301, an internet mystery. Flying Tanks, the terrifying genius of Mike Sparks. Tree Sentinels, Educator. And by God, you will learn. I didn't learn shit. I did it for seven hours. <laughs> it's supposed to teach me to leave. <laughs> uh, Cicada goes hard. How long, how long is it? 17 minutes. 28 million? <laughs> All right, we'll try it. On the 4th of January, 2012, a user on 4chan posted this image to the site's infamous B or random board. The anonymous author, who went by the four-digit pseudonym 3301, challenged users to uncover a message hidden within the image. Unbeknownst to those who stumbled across it, someone had just set in motion one of the most elaborate scavenger hunts the internet has ever seen. Within minutes of the image being posted, someone discovered that by opening the file using a text editor, an appended string of readable text could be found. The string contained a cipher that, once deciphered, formed a link to yet another image. At first, this appeared to be a dead end, but using an application known as OutGuess, users were able to extract hidden information embedded within the first image. <laughs> the extracted information led to a subreddit, which in turn contained information about the book. The book, along with a code, could then be used to uncover a phone number Holy that, when shit. called, played this pre-recorded message. If all this ended with a troll face, it would be the greatest 4chan thing of all time. <laughs> if this is 17 minutes long of deciphering different codes and then it ends to a fucking link of a Rickroll. <laughs> it links to a fucking Rickroll. Oh, that would be fucking fire. Very good. You have done well. There are three prime numbers associated with the original final dot JPEG image. Three three zero one is one of them. You will have to find the other two. Oh my God! This Multiply is insanely all three complicated. three of these numbers together and add a dot com on the end to find the next step. Good luck. Goodbye. By the following day, the initial image had been reposted all over the internet. Damn, the music's fire in this. A growing community of armchair detectives sought to unravel this elaborate puzzle, but no one was quite sure what to make of it. What was the puzzle for? Who was behind it? What happens when you reach the end? Some naturally dismissed it as an elaborate <laughs> joke, while others perceived its complexity as evidence against it being the work of a mere troll. Before long, rumors began to circulate that this could be the work of some secret society or intelligence agency, with the intent of recruiting individuals proficient in cryptography, steganography, <laughs> and other related fields. Of course, it was nothing but a rumor. The two missing numbers mentioned in the recording proved to be the dimensions of the original image. After multiplying the width and height with 3301 and using the product as a web address, users were taken to a website. The website consisted of a countdown as well as an image of a cicada. When the countdown reached zero, the page was updated with a list of coordinates. 
the coordinates pointed to locations around the globe, Jesus 14 Christ. locations in five different countries. It was now up to participants living near the specified coordinates to rise from their comfortable armchairs and venture outside. Those who believed Cicada to be the work of an organization now felt their beliefs had been justified. In their opinion, only some international collective possessed the means and resources to create a scavenger hunt of this magnitude. This was not the work of your average troll. No, this had to be something else. At each location was a poster with a Cicada symbol and a QR code. And that bike shelter over here. See, I got a got it right there. Oh. You can see the corners, I was excited, I just kind of ripped it off. The codes linked to an image, the image contained a riddle, the riddle led to a book, and the book led to a website. <laughs> but here, the puzzle took an unexpected turn. Only a select group of first arrivals to this website were accepted into the final stage of the puzzle. The site eventually closed down with the message, we want the best, not the followers. Sigma. The finalists were also warned not to collaborate with others nor to share the details of this private stage of the puzzle. Well, uh, given that we know this, it's safe to say that not everyone heeded that warning. Right. But those who did presumably advanced through the final stages before reaching the very end of the puzzle. No help. <laughs> After nearly a month of silence, an image appeared on the subreddit announcing the conclusion of the puzzle, and just like that, the hunt was over. Cicada had supposedly found the highly intelligent individuals they were looking for, and whatever happened to them is a bit of a mystery, but more on that in a moment. The complete lack of an explanation was perceived by many as confirmation that the puzzle had been nothing but a wild goose chase intent on wasting everyone's time. <laughs> After all, questions raised by the original image remained unanswered. What was the puzzle for? Who was behind it? What happens when you reach the end? However, as it later turned out, this was only the beginning. Mm. Heard of this, it's crazy. Whomever was behind this intricate game had the foresight to include an authentication code known as a PGP signature along with every clue. This allowed users to verify that an image or message was actually from Cicada, as opposed to some imposter seeking to derail or hijack the puzzle. Wow. Cicada had repeatedly warned of such false paths and insisted that any message lacking a valid PGP signature should promptly be disregarded. That's why this image, posted exactly a year and a day after the first, provoked such a frenzy. After a year of lackluster imitations, this image finally matched the official PGP signature. Cicada was back, and it was time for round two. Interesting. The second puzzle was not too dissimilar from the first. The image enclosed a message, the message led to a book, the book produced a link, and gradually the puzzle unfolded. At one point, a recording titled The Instar Emergence was uncovered. This is on my gym playlist. It goes hard as hell. Another clue led to a cryptic Twitter account, which then led to an image. The image proved vital to the progression of the puzzle, but the inclusion of this runic alphabet would remain a mystery for quite Runescape? some time. Much like the first puzzle, the second swelled into the physical world when a list of coordinates compelled participants to once again take to the streets in search of enigmatic posters. This time it was eight locations in four different countries. But eventually the trail went cold once again. Another select group of first arrivals had been accepted into a final, private stage of the puzzle. Unlike the first puzzle, the second did not conclude with an official message from Cicada. The trail merely went cold, and Cicada vanished once What's more, happening to these leaving people? us no closer to an explanation. However, this was still not the end.
At the beginning of 2014, it was time for round three. This is in 2014. Once again, the image enclosed a message, the message led to a book, the book produced a link, and suffice it to say, it was more of the same. Except this time, the puzzle seemed to revolve around a strange- Bro, what if this is just Jeff Bezos trying to sell more books on Amazon? <laughs> If you have to buy a copy of these shitty unsold books, dude. <laughs> and if he moves an extra 14 units, it's worth it. Book. The book was titled Liber Primus, meaning first book <laughs> in Latin, and was evidently written by Cicada. The runic alphabet uncovered in 2013 finally made sense as the book was primarily written in runes. E even so, the meaning of the translated pages were cryptic at best. The book consisted of various philosophical and ideological ideas and appeared to be their manifesto. Many have since compared the strange writings to that of a cult. Nevertheless, the book also comprised a myriad of Bunker? clues and codes. For example, this page advised participants to seek out a website on the deep web, but the site remains undiscovered. Another page led to a website containing yet another recording titled Interconnectedness. You put this in a Nintendo game, people call it the greatest song ever written. <laughs> you put this in a field in Zelda, people will fucking cream about it for the next 20 years. <laughs> However, a significant portion of the book has yet to be translated. The runic text on some of the pages appear to be obfuscated by layers of encryption that has yet to be decrypted. Of the 74 pages featuring runes, only 19 have been successfully translated. Mm. As 2015 came and went without the launch of a new puzzle, many came to suspect the Liber Primus had to be completed if Cicada was to return. This was more or less confirmed at the beginning of 2016 when Cicada encouraged a re-examination of the book. More than four years have now gone by with minimal progress and near complete silence from Cicada. Damn, he's, they're probably Questions <laughs> raised by the original. What do they get it? The puzzle's so obvious. <laughs> they're not even looking on page 14. Anyway, nobody cares anymore. It's round three, dude. Original image have gone ignored. What is the purpose of these puzzles? Who's behind them? What happens when you reach the end? <laughs> What? Is this part of it? When the initial image appeared on 4chan back in 2012, many assumed Cicada 3301 to be an alternate reality game designed by a corporation to promote a new service or product. What kind of fucking alternate reality game goes on for four years before announcing the product? There's no shot. It's the worst marketing I've ever heard. <laughs> For example, Microsoft. Did Cyberpunk? <laughs> Shit. It could have been Cyberpunk, dude. Oh, maybe they spent too much time on this fucking puzzle and not enough time fixing the bugs. Developed an elaborate ARG back in 2001 to promote the film Artificial Intelligence, and a similar viral marketing campaign was used to promote yeah, the, the I Love Bees. Too. But the release of subsequent puzzles and the complete lack of commercialization has more or less eliminated that possibility. If we choose to believe some of the leaked information from the private end stage of each puzzle, then we do gain some insight into who this group might be. For example, at the end of the first puzzle, finalists supposedly received this email. In it, Cicada described themselves as an international group who believe that privacy is an inalienable right. The aim of each puzzle is to recruit like-minded individuals in an effort to develop privacy-conscious solutions. The email then concludes with three questions. The PGP signature, which would have confirmed the authenticity of the email, was conveniently removed by the leaker. If a version with a valid signature does exist online, I was unable to find it. But regardless of its legitimacy, I find this question a bit odd. 
It reads, do you believe that information should be free? Assuming the expected answer is yes, then the very first sentence, do not share this information, seems a bit hypocritical. While the idea of a secret society recruiting individuals by means of elaborate cryptographic puzzles may seem a bit absurd or even conspiratorial, it's not entirely unfounded. Corporations and governments alike have employed similar recruitment techniques since at least the Second World War. In 2013, the British intelligence agency GCHQ launched a recruitment program known as Can You Find It? Participants had to decrypt a number of cryptograms hidden across the internet and those who managed to solve the entire puzzle were offered a price or a position at the agency. Oh. Google did something similar with enigmatic billboards back in 2004 and the US Navy launched a near identical project in 2014. Okay, but then what about the recruits? Why have we not heard from these chosen few? Uh, well, we have. Dude, imagine <laughs> finding a hidden puzzle, going through like weeks of cracking it, <laughs> you know, fucking using the most insane giga brain uh, cryptography to crack it, and then you get a fucking desk job at the Navy. <laughs> they offer you like 65K <laughs> to go work. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> It's just that separating a legitimate finalist from an imposter is virtually impossible. In a 2015 interview with Rolling Stone, two alleged winners of the first puzzle chronicled the events beyond the final stage. After receiving an email from Cicada, they were taken to a forum on the dark web. Here they could communicate with 20-some-odd recruits as well as a handful of established members of Cicada. They were told that Cicada 3301 had been founded by a group of friends who shared common ideals about security, privacy, and censorship. The goal was to work as a collective to develop software applications in line with that ideology. As friends recruited friends, this secret society quickly expanded into a decentralized international organization. The recruits were then tasked with developing software that fit the ideology of the group, and members of Cicada would oversee their progress. But without the allure of a puzzle to be solved, the recruits quickly lost interest. By the end of 2012, all but one had left, and a few months later... The so it's just unpaid labor? <laughs> it's worse than I said! It's worse! You made a whole bunch of puzzles to recruit smart people to do unpaid coding labor? For, what, your privacy startup? The site was gone. They never heard from Cicada again. <laughs> One of the two winners. It's like whenever people are recruiting interns or like entry level jobs and they make you do like a test to do the job. And it's like almost always just labor they need done. Like, could you make a marketing plan for, <laughs> for our business or <laughs> show us how you would do a weekly social plan or something? And then you just do it. And then it's like, oh, we didn't go with your direction. But then they use your work anyway. It's the scummiest fucking thing. It's, it's almost what this is. Here's the first puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Write the code for my side Google job that I'm doing while I make this weird cicada thing. ...named Marcus Wanner later elaborated further in a video by YouTuber Nox Populi. Furthermore, Nox Populi himself claims to be a winner of the second puzzle, so I reached out to him and this is some of what he had to say. After completing... Like, for example, I told Quack that I was actually a member of a secret society that was recruiting only the elite, most intelligent members. <laughs> and if he could solve the puzzle of how to edit my videos into 100,000 plus views... <laughs> <laughs> then uh, he might be able to unlock the key. And so far, he's been really cracking on it. Hopefully, he can <laughs> he can keep it up. In the final stages of the second puzzle, Nox Populi received an invitation to join Cicada 3301. However, he was not invited to a website, but was instead merely told to be patient. Then, around May of 2013, all communication with Cicada abruptly ceased. This was around the same time as when the website dedicated to the winners of the first puzzle was suddenly taken down. Nox Populi later contacted other winners of the second puzzle to compare notes, and their experiences were identical. In his own words, 
all the stories were the same. We were invited to join 3301, then something happened and silence followed a request for patience. Nox Populi supposed that roughly five others completed the second puzzle, in contrast to the twenty-odd winners of the first. In regards to who or what Cicada is, Nox Populi believes they could be a remnant of the cypherpunk movement of the late 80s and 90s. Essentially a small group of activists advocating widespread use of strong cryptography and privacy-enhancing technologies, but he admits that there is no way to know for certain. If you want a far more comprehensive walkthrough of these puzzles as opposed to my brief overview, Nox Populi has produced a number of videos on his channel which I highly recommend. While these accounts cannot be verified, they do make for a very compelling argument as to what Cicada is. A group of anonymous developers seeking to develop privacy-conscious applications by recruiting talented individuals via cryptographic puzzles. Sure, it is not nearly as exciting as a shadow government seeking world domination or any of the more fantastical theories, but it right. is certainly more plausible. You have to keep couldn't they have just put a job listing on Monster <laughs> or like LinkedIn? I feel like they would have got a, a good number of developers <laughs> and could have actually started work on this project. I, they just needed to pay people. Keep in mind that no part of these puzzles would have required more than one person. The posters are often pointed to as evidence that this must be the work of some international organization, but I beg to differ. I mean, right now, I could use any number of services to hire random persons around the globe to install posters for me. Yeah. Although, given that no poster was located more than an hour away from an airport leads me to believe that one or multiple persons actually traveled to these locations. I mean, it's some of insane. the posters were found within walking distance of an international airport. The fact is that anyone with a disposable income and enough time on their hands would be able to create the illusion of a vast, secret network spanning the globe. Dude, well, you need a lot of money. I'm not saying that that is the case with Cicada 3301, but it is nonetheless a possibility that cannot be discounted. With all of that being said, I personally think a loose-knit group of privacy-minded hobby cryptographers to be the most plausible explanation. Cicada made their last public statement in April of 2017, merely warning against this information. But the current status of the third puzzle, and the possibility of a fourth, remains clouded in mystery. Damn, that was kind of fire. I'm sad it didn't come to a conclusion, though. That was a, I've never heard of that. That was a crazy video, though. Let's see what else we got. Let's see what else we got. Get Smarter Saturdays. Brought to you by Factor Meals. Thank you again to Factor for continuing to sponsor Get Smarter Saturdays. Um, legitimately love Factor. Eat it every day that it's available. I go through the box a little bit too quickly now. I have to save one, so I have it for Saturday. Um... Yeah, they're awesome. They're tasty. They save me money. Uh, you get to pick the ones you have. My favorite is the salmon. That's the one I've been loading up on, but the pancakes are pretty good too. Uh, let's see what we got. Big A must watch for real. Mac tonight. I don't know about that. Uh, CJP Gray, you are too. How a British pickle merchant became a Uyghur king. How humans broke the game. Treasure Planet, Dizzy's biggest mistake. Um, labor shortage. I applied for 1,000 jobs to find out. It's kind of interesting. I decided to apply for 1,000 jobs because I keep hearing that the job market is broken. Well, let's find out how bad it really is. Where have all the workers gone? Labor is scarce right now. So I think I'm going to apply for these jobs using fictional names. Now, in the 2005 book, Freakonomics, they talked about applying for jobs using the same resumes with different names at the top. And in their words, a white sounding name and a black sounding name. So I pulled the names Tanner and Demetrius from their list and those are gonna be the names I used to apply for the jobs. I'll be applying with the same exact- I'm gonna tell you this actually, um, when Ari was applying for jobs, 
thankfully, um, she can do her cosplay business now. But when she was applying for jobs and she used her actual last name, which is Trujillo, she was getting fewer callbacks than when she used Ewing, which I just told her to try, even though we haven't. Um, we're not officially married yet, but I just told her to try it because I'd read the thing in Freakonomics as well. Super cringe. Resumes, just changing the names at the top. Now, since it's been so long since I've done my own resume, I'm going to buy a template from Etsy. Okay, so the main issue I'm having with this is that almost every template I'm seeing has some sort of objective statement or profile section, so I may just have to get one and delete that. I'm no resume expert, but I've always thought those sections were kind of pointless and yeah. silly. So it says here your objective is to become a master at taxidermy. So are you applied for an accounting job? You do know there's a big difference between taxidermy and taxes, right? Oh yeah, no, just skip that. I, I was literally just too lazy to put in the title of this job. So in my opinion, the best <laughs> case scenario is it gives no information. Being that I'm gonna be applying for a thousand jobs, I wanna do as little customization as possible. True. Okay, so I ended up buying and filling out a couple resumes here, and I must say, I think we got a couple winners. Now, I'll be the first to admit, filling out resumes was a bit more challenging than I expected. That said, I filled these out based on the way I would like to see them as a potential employer. So I've got these two different resumes, and I think I'm gonna do a total of two different versions of each one. One where the candidate is expecting to graduate from college in the next few months, and another where our candidate never went to college and just has a high school diploma. So when all is said and done, we're gonna have four resumes. Each resume is gonna have a college and a high school version, and we're gonna swap out the names Demetrius and Tanner on each one. As far as work experience goes, I'm gonna have one version with a well-known retailer. The other is gonna be a well-known and well-respected restaurant chain. Now to keep track of all the responses, I set up a new email address and a new phone number for each resume for each this of our candidates. This is a lot of effort, okay. It took a lot of work, but we're ready to apply for jobs. So this application is asking for a joke. How about, I don't really know how to say this to you, but Worcestershire. Okay, here's one. Do you speak Spanish? I'll say yes. And in parentheses, si. Which if you didn't know is Spanish for sure. So the way that I'm actually applying for all these jobs is one of two methods. First, I took a list of the S&P 500 companies, so 500 of the largest companies in the US, and I just go to their career site and you look for entry level jobs. The next way is I'm going to career websites like Indeed, Career Builder, and I'm searching for entry level jobs on there. I find companies and positions through there and then go directly to their websites. In my own experience, when I've received applications, it always meant a lot more if they went directly to our website as opposed to a job board. Right. And with this click here, I believe that is job application 1000. That took quite a bit longer than I expected. The worst part of the process is you upload a resume and then not having to refill all the information in. But when the system attempts to upload your information into the fields, but does it incorrectly, and then you have to go back and delete all that information. <laughs> and that react sucks. again. The yeah, second it's worst really is annoying. assessment test. Instead of taking two or three minutes to apply for a job, you do an assessment test and you're talking 15, sometimes 20 minutes to apply for a job. The first few were like a little bit fun, but after two or three, they were just brutal. Now, one thing that was surprising in this whole process is, you know, the old <laughs> meme of entry level job, but requires three to five years experience. Well, I didn't track it for all 1000 jobs, but I did take a sample of 50 of the jobs that I applied for. Of those 50, 21 of the jobs specifically said, either in the job title or in the job description, that they were an entry level position. Of those 21, only two specifically said that they required experience. Another six said something about experience preferred. The rest of those 21 didn't say anything about experience required, experience preferred, and some even advertised that no experience was required. So I think the meme is kind of <laughs> true to an extent, but gets a bit exaggerated more than reality. Though I did hear about a company one time asking for 10 years of experience in a programming language that had only been around for seven years. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is time for the results. I did decide to put on a suit and tie in honor of all the job wow, interviews. Wow, snazzy. I didn't go on. 
Our initial goal was to apply for a thousand jobs. After a double count and a recount, we ended up applying for a thousand and three. Ooh. I always say it's better to be a little bit long. <laughs> but probably nobody's surprised, not all jobs out there are valid and currently open. In fact, I called one pizza company about a job that had been out there for six months. Here's what they said. I was looking online and I saw that you guys have an opening for a pizza maker. Is that job still open? No, we're actually only hiring drivers now. Oh, okay. I saw it had been out there for six months and, and so that one's not available. Just drivers? Nope, not anymore. Because of this, I tried to limit my job search to jobs that had been posted recently and really tried to find jobs that were offering $15 an hour or higher. With that said, 62% of the jobs applied for had some sort of wage, the average wage being $17.36. And I came up with this number by taking the low end of the range. So if a job was listing $15 to $17 per hour, I would take the $15 per hour number and use that in the calculation. For jobs that listed an annual salary, I calculated the comparable hourly wage. Now with that said, across the 1,003 job applications, we received a total of 259 interview requests. We also got 47 flat out rejections. Oh. In addition to all of that, we got 87 calls where they didn't leave a message and I wasn't sure where the call came from. If we assume <laughs> all of those calls were to set up an interview, that would push our return rate to 35%. I decided to throw those out though because even on the first day that we had the number set up, I was already receiving spam calls. So net net, that leaves us with around 650 jobs with no response. Now I'm sure some of those are like the pizza job and no longer valid, but obviously we're going on about 10 days now. If you haven't called us back yet, you're probably not that thirsty for employees. Right. I'm married now, but back in my dating days, if a girl hadn't called back in 10 days. Now when you compare resume A <laughs> versus resume B, Resume B did quite a bit better. In fact, of the applications where really? I used Resume A, regardless of college, high school, or whose name was on top of it, Resume A received a response rate of 22%. You compare that to Resume B, and it got a response rate of around 30%. I'm not sure if it was the content, the layout. I'm not sure what the difference was. I tried to make them really comparable. Not too different. I was a different. little surprised at the difference. College versus high school was also pretty interesting. Again, I mean, I've only known one guy named Tanner and he was fucking stupid. <laughs> so if I got a resume from a guy named Tanner, I, you know, I got to I think pretty hard about it. <laughs> what is small ass named Tanner? That's who I was thinking of. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Sorry, small. <laughs> he was fucking stupid and he's a fucking award thief. Is what I knew. This one Tanner that I knew. Totally unrelated. <laughs> the same resumes just changed the education section. And keep in mind that I only applied for he jobs. He was a kid home. when I lived in. It was seventh grade in Kansas. There was a kid named Tanner, and he was just really, really annoying. Were qualified for. So if a job required a college degree, I would apply for it with the college resume but I would skip those with the high school resume. When it comes to response rate on the applications where I use the resume where we were just about to graduate from college, I got a response rate of around 22.4%. Now the high school resume received a response rate of about 35%. And the first reaction may be as well, does it actually hurt you to have a college degree in the labor market? I think there's a couple reasons for why those two. I mean, one of it's probably he's applying for jobs that specifically say entry level, right? So they're probably worried that if you have a college degree, you might quit. You might be like extremely temporary. And with the high school, I'm going to stick around. That's, that's probably a first two may be pretty different. For one, with the college resume, I was applying for a little bit higher quality jobs. A lot of these jobs require. Oh, you did different degree, jobs. And so they're probably a little bit more competitive. But well, I think even what a might have been even more impactful than that, though, was with the college resume, we were expected to graduate in about three months. Whereas the high school resume, we had already graduated. That means that employers that couldn't wait an additional three months might have skipped over the college application. So now when it comes to using Demetrius versus Tanner, again, same resumes on everything else, 
We just swapped out the names. In total, Tanner got a response rate of around 25%. There's a lot of variables. And Demetrius had a response rate of about 26%. Statistically, basically I think the they same. were basically the same. And when you look at high school versus college, the two were basically the same there as well. Demetrius got a just a little bit better response rate than Tanner. Now, if I really wanted to test out this name theory, I would probably do very similar resumes and send them all into the same company. The main purpose of this exercise was to get a sense of what the general labor market is like. So I intentionally tried to avoid using multiple resumes to apply for the same job at the same company. I was concerned that multiple resumes may tip off an employer and they might throw out our applications altogether and thus throwing off or skewing our stats. That said, there were eight jobs where I sent in a resume for both people and I didn't receive a response back on any of the eight. So I think my takeaway here is that the entry-level job market seems to be pretty strong, at least at the time of this video. Getting an interview request back on a third of the applications sent in, that's pretty good, I think. Now, how many of those would have turned into actual jobs? I mean, we'll never know. If you enjoyed this video, YouTube <laughs> thinks you're gonna like this one. I gotta be honest, that wasn't that informative. <laughs> I feel like there was a lot, I mean, he did a lot of work and I respect it, but I feel like it was kind of pointless and there was so many variables that you didn't account for and you didn't really end up on any, I think he wasted a lot more of your time than ours, but I don't feel like I was used very valuably. Um, yeah, I'm going to give that a cringe out of 10. <laughs> let's see what else we got uh invisible sound design in breath of the wild world war ii's turning point the battle of midway uh the journey to elden ring day 620 wait what the perfect batman beyond episode that's just for me mm -hmm. Need for Speed, A History. Why Michelin created the Michelin Star. No. Uh, the Ants. Mysterious title. Mm. If two gay guys kiss, it isn't gay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, how people disappear by Vsauce. Interesting. Castles are engineered to kill you. I think we all knew that, but it seems interesting. It's a good thumbnail. Mm. Mac tonight's about McDonald's marketing. Hold up. Did you know that the average adult has five to 20 pounds of toxic poop in their body at any given moment? That's ads. <laughs> we see them every day. And when we do, it's almost always against our will. The average American is exposed to at least 5,000 ads per day. If given the choice, most of us would probably prefer to see zero. It turns out that wow. most people don't like being interrupted we like every some five of them, seconds right? by a manipulative Friends sales pitch. Games. Frames win An games. insane individual would be far better off avoiding ads whenever possible. It's for this reason that marketing is such a tall order. How do you make people pay attention to something that no one wants to see? Out of the 5,000 ads we see per day, how many do we even register as anything more than... Can we take a moment to talk about... Factor meals for a second. I just want you guys to think about how delicious and nutritious Factor meals are <laughs> and if you use code pog a truck 120 you get 120 dollars off your first box thanks which way factor in chat thank you again to factor meals for sponsoring get smarter saturdays than white noise the vast majority of marketing campaigns are utterly forgettable and the handful of ads that actually manage to stand out usually do so for the wrong reasons. <laughs> However, once in a blue moon, we'll encounter an ad that extraordinarily that beats the odds. One that we remember for long after whatever they were selling ceased to exist. 
In 1986, America's most powerful restaurant empire deployed a marketing campaign so brilliant that it still has a place in our culture more than 35 years later. But the full story of one of advertising's most timeless mascots goes back a bit further than 35 years. It all began with an Englishman by the name of John Gay, who in 1728 would unveil the play of the century. The Beggar's Opera was a theatrical performance unlike anything else in its time. Okay. It was an opera that set out to make a mockery of opera itself. It not only ridiculed the conventions of the medium, but served as an irreverent critique of the aristocratic world it often glorified. Mm. The Beggar's Opera was one of the first definitive examples of counterculture, one that satirized issues of wealth and corruption among England's most powerful institutions. Based? The show was beloved by audiences, and essentially became the first opera to belong to the common man. This resounding success was due in large part to the play's main character, Captain McKeith. Considered by some to be one of literature's first anti-heroes, <laughs> portrayed as a womanizing thief. <laughs> it's McKeith crazy how in the third act he turns into a pickle. <laughs> and he sings a whole song in a pickle voice. That was like so out of its time. People didn't talk about that enough. Keith was a character of questionable virtue and undeniable passion. One who succeeded in winning over the audience despite his inherent vices. The Beggar's Opera was the most revolutionary play of its time and would go on to inspire a whole new genre of satirical comedy in theater. Just four years after releasing his magnum opus, John Gay would pass away at the age of 47, never to know what would eventually become of his creation. While his story had ended, Captain Max had only just begun. 200 years Bash. later, The Beggar's Opera would Sorry, experience a revival in Germany. The play would be retooled by Marxist playwright Bertolt Brecht, who intended to punctuate its anti-capitalist themes. Now renamed to the Three Penny Opera, the show would once again captivate the masses. Captain Mack would return to his leading role, now wielding a far more unsavory demeanor. <laughs> this darker version of the character would henceforth be known by another name, Mack the Knife. Like, the new moniker quickly caught so on much less heroic. an unexpected addition to the play. Shortly before the premiere, lead actor Harold Paulson threatened to walk out of the production unless his character received a special introduction. With very little time to spare, composer Kurt Weill quickly devised what would become the most iconic musical number of the entire play, The Ballad of Mac the Knife. Oh, sing along, chat, you know the words. A song that depicts Mac as a serial killer who stabs his victims to death and dumps their bodies in the river. You might be thinking that this far more sinister version of the character would have made him somewhat unpopular, but as yeah. fate would have it, the exact opposite was true. Wait, what? After its successful debut in Germany, the Three Penny Opera would soon be translated and performed in numerous other countries. By the 1950s, the play had arrived in the United States, where it began a six-year run as an off-Broadway show. Joker, yeah. <laughs> At around the same time, He's musicians the first Joker. began recording their own versions of the play's defining song. Louis Armstrong's 1955 cover of Mac the Knife established the tune as a jazz staple. Over the years, more than a dozen artists would put their own spin on the song. But by far the most enduring version would be the one released by Bobby Darin in 1959. Isn't there a Frank Sinatra version? Bobby Darin singing Mac the Knife. Let's have a nice hand for him. I think I've actually heard this. Oh yeah, I've heard this. Has such teeth the single rocketed to the top of the charts in the US and UK, cementing yeah, I was Mac there. the Knife <laughs> as an international phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> Darren's big hit resembled the popular genre of crooner music, songs characterized by a smooth, soft-spoken male singer paired with big band jazz instrumentals. Those are the good days. The style was most closely associated with performers like Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby. Nailed it. Two figures who are inseparable chills, dude. I got little chills. century Americana. But considering the sanitized culture of 1950s America, it's unusual how something as dark as Mac the Knife wound up being such a mainstream hit. In a time when you weren't allowed to show a toilet on TV, it's somewhat shocking to consider that one of its most popular songs happened to be about a serial killer. Just like the case with nearly all pop music Yep, today. that's what things with the shit. When they started allowing toilets on TV, 
Toilets on TV, dude. That was the downhill point for all society. Most listeners just never pay attention to the lyrics. With that being said, it's not a stretch to suggest that Mac the Knife was essentially the pumped up kicks of the boomer generation. <laughs> there was just this guy in my neighborhood. We used to call him Jimmy Smash. Call me and say, hey Jimmy, sing Mac the Knife. And because he wanted to hang out with us, he'd belt it right out. <laughs> in just 30 years, the song had reached unimaginable heights from its humble German origin. And coincidentally, at around the same Gabagool. time, a certain other German creation would also experience a meteoric rise in the United States. At the turn of the 20th century, a new food item was quickly picking up steam in the American <laughs> cuisine. The delicacy was thought to have been brought over by immigrants originating from Hamburg, Germany. Of course, this exciting new sandwich would soon become known as the hamburger. This is so and much intro to get to McDonald's. Diet, no other food would be more influential. The success of the we hamburger. We do love our hamburgers. Two key advantages. It was a hearty meal that could be prepared very quickly and very cheaply. The founding tenets of America's most famous industry, fast food. In 1961, businessman Ray Kroc completed what was essentially a hostile takeover of the McDonald brothers and their chain of California mm -hmm. restaurants. Under the founder is a great movie, McDonald's by the way. McDonald's would revolutionize the American food industry with one simple vision. The idea that a customer could visit any restaurant in the country and order an identical sandwich. After a decade of aggressive expansion, the Golden Arches would span from sea to shining sea. McDonald's had become one of the first truly national brands in America. The new fast food empire ushered in a new era of commerce, and along with it, a new challenge in marketing. Sell me, Miss Penn. <laughs> Compared to other disciplines, <laughs> advertising is relatively new. The practice only began to be seriously studied at around the turn of the 20th century. But while research into the field may still be quite young, it all seeks to answer the same age-old question. Both the art and the science of advertising exist to figure out what people want. Selling a product requires so much more than simply making people aware of its existence. The power of marketing relies on infiltrating the gooey center of human desire. It attempts to deliver us our grandest fantasies, to exploit our deepest fears and insecurities. The purpose of advertising is not to give people what they want, but to give redefine them the, the meaning of want. Most products and services in the economy are totally superfluous. They offer the customer no intrinsic value versus any replacement level item. It is the job of the advertiser to manufacture that value, to convince the customer that Increase a product perceived is more value? than a product. And perhaps no other company understood this concept more than McDonald's, which sought to brand itself as not just a restaurant, but an American institution. McDonald's prospered by getting working class families out of their dining rooms and into their restaurants. The Golden Arches came to symbolize an oasis of comfort and familiarity. No matter how far you were from home, you were never too far from a McDonald's. <laughs> Across the 60s and 70s, McDonald's marketing acumen brought them tremendous success. Success which quickly drew in competitors. And soon enough, the franchise had several challengers to their fast food Where's the throw. beef? The 1980s were truly a landmark time in advertising as newly titanic brands the 1984 fought control ad. over a nation of consumers. The marketing battles fought during this time period would dictate the industry leaders of the 21st century. Three Companies trillion dollar Apple. That valuable market share Ooh, was that's a great ad. Based solely on their ability the Spike to Lee sell Jordan to ad? the American people. As the dominant force in fast food, McDonald's quickly found themselves with a target on their back. All of a sudden, the franchise was under fire from an onslaught of commercials attacking both the quality and quantity of their product. McDonald's was thrust into an advertising arms race, spending millions on radical new campaigns of their own. The However, McDLT? despite their best efforts to subdue their rivals, the company was still losing ground. In order to protect their empire, they had to start thinking outside the box. Or Fortunately the bun. for McDonald's, an unexpected flash of inspiration would come from their biggest business partner. Hi, Max Headroom here with 
This is my guest. In 1985, Coca-Cola was looking to regain momentum following the rocky launch of New Coke. They would find a rather unorthodox solution in Max Headroom, an obscure experimental character who had recently sprung up on the British airwaves. The virtual talking head replaced Bill Cosby as Coca-Cola's spokesperson, a change that was met with massive success. Coke had proven the value of manufacturing a cult icon, inspiring I mean, McDonald's to brainstorm a character. Well, okay, that's not entirely true. Max Headroom was very popular, but New Coke was not. Like, I think it only grew the brand of the Max Headroom character. It didn't actually help. Bro, like many great creative minds before them, they decided to borrow from the past. And in the winter of 1986, America would be introduced to Mac Tonight. When the clock strikes, half their six fail, turn to hit. This is what all the build-up was for? the fourth time in his long and convoluted history, Mac was once again on top of the world. McDonald's had deployed a variety of corporate mascots before, but none moved the needle quite like Mac. It was an ad campaign unlike any other in the company's history. The anthropomorphic crescent moon was a surreal window into the soul of American enterprise. <laughs> it was bold, decadent, and idealistic. A perfect marriage of nostalgia and pure fantasy. For the fast food eating public, Mac Tonight truly delivered something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. Wait, this is a joke. While conceiving the ad, marketing executive Brad Ball and director Peter Katrolis sought to create a veritable Mictopia. The hand built miniatures and practical costume work gives Mac Tonight an otherworldly aesthetic. A parallel reality where McDonald's has single handedly ushered in a new epoch of human advancement. <laughs> A glorious vision of a society that had long since transcended its struggles with crime, poverty, and especially, hunger. It was the greasy, delicious future that all of us needed, but oh none my of us God. deserved. For Los Angeles marketing firm DMJC, it was lightning in a bottle. What was originally planned as a regional campaign quickly expanded nationwide. The ad made a huge impression on consumers with some stores reporting more than a 10% increase in dinnertime business. McDonald's brand recognition skyrocketed, giving the franchise the boost it needed to pull away from its competitors. And in Paris, you can buy a beer at McDonald's. <laughs> what did it call a Whopper? I don't know, I didn't go on a burger chain. Oh shit. The character of Mac Tonight was so popular that scheduled meet and greets wow, were drawn over like... a thousand visitors from LA to Boca Raton. Over the next three years, actor and contortionist Doug Jones would strap into the moon costume for 25 more commercials. The popularity of the campaign would mark a turning That's point crazy. in his career. Today, he is best known for his leading role of the amphibian man in Academy Award winning film The Shape of Water. <laughs> it seemed that no matter where or when Mac appeared, roaring success was sure to follow. By the end of the 80s, he was basking on cloud nine lifting a fast food empire and its investors all the way to the moon. It must but have faded quick. The company's greatest marketing campaign to date, not all was well in McDonald land. By becoming the face of the franchise, Mac had strayed a bit too far from his roots. The character was originally conceived as a critique of wealth and capitalism, only to eventually wind up as the mascot for the most capitalistic company on the planet. The once iconoclastic Captain Mac had effectively sold out, and unfortunately for him, the pendulum was about to swing in the other direction. As fate would have it, the corporate gravy train that he now represented would soon betray him, as Mac tonight was sacrificed for the system. <laughs> oh, they were sued! In October 1989, Dodd Darren filed a $10 million lawsuit against McDonald's claiming that Mac Tonight had infringed on his father's song. 
At face value, it looked like a pretty nonsensical confrontation. That doesn't make sense Bobby because... Bobby Darren had passed away more than 15 years earlier. And his defining single wasn't exactly the most original yeah, He didn't own that song. He didn't write the lyrics. He wasn't the first to perform the song. He hadn't single-handedly invented the crooner's style. Like many works involving Mac, it was derivative content that just so happened to be in the right place at the right time. It's hard to say what Bobby Darren even owned that McDonald's could have possibly infringed Yeah, upon. he didn't own anything. But due to the oppressive nature of our wonderful copyright system, not even Fortune 500 companies are exempt from I guess they were just didn't, around didn't want the risk. Greed. Had McDonald's fought the lawsuit, they could have very easily won. And they probably would have won. they decided that the legal expense was simply not worth the trouble to save an ad campaign that had pretty much run its course. With very little to gain in court, McDonald's chose to bite the bullet. And so, after nearly four years of service, Mac Tonight's golden run I can't, on the airwaves I mean, <laughs> would come to an abrupt end. Are we supposed to be sad Who about this? That after all this time, <laughs> it doesn't even look Mac that good. I mean, got to experience what it was like to get stabbed <laughs> in the back. <laughs> you guys are attached Father to Mac. Colin mascot was an no 80s mascot to perform his signature jingles. <laughs> McDonald's wouldn't entirely give up on Mac Tonight. Starting in the 90s, they would install several Mac animatronics, which wow, played really? retro hits in stores across the country. During this time, Mac would still occasionally appear in commercials, including a brief campaign in 1997. Uh, that year what? would also see Mac. I was playing Pokemon in 90s. I've never seen this. Make his debut in NASCAR, appearing as a select sponsor on Bill Elliott's number 94 Ford. In 2007, 20 years 2007? after his debut, a CG Mac would suddenly resurface on the international market, announcing the opening of 24-hour locations in Southeast Asia. But beyond these sparse for... sightings, Mac Tonight was essentially retired, left to ride off into the sunset as a marketing martyr and a hamburger hero. An ending that was a little too good to be true. By transforming Mac into the perfect company mascot, McDonald's had to omit the character's more distasteful attributes. Of course! It was a character who was never designed to be a hero. Do you think they're gonna make a fucking serial killing burger mascot? What are you talking about? Wait, what is left of this video? I, I don't like this video at all. <laughs> and one who had spent the past two decades running from the sins of his past. The truth is that Mac had built his legacy not through fame. <laughs> what do you think Ronald is? Notoriety. <laughs> Ronald's a hitman, the there's a difference. Turn of events, everyone would be rudely reminded about the dark side of the moon. In the mid-2000s, the internet revolution was in full swing. A popular site at the time was the online community YTMND. You're the man now, dog. users could create their own web pages with looping images and audio. The site quickly became a prominent spawning ground for various memes and subcultures. And in the Wild West era of online moderation, practically nothing was off limits. Possibly the most infamous series of events to ever come out of YTMND just so happened to involve a certain McDonald's mascot. Users had begun posting GIFs of Mac Tonight as early as 2006, but the character's downward descent into degeneracy would truly begin in the spring of 2007, all due to an individual by the name of Farkle. Starting in June, he created several sites combining Mac Tonight with AT&T Mike, a text-to-speech bot that could be made to say anything the user desired. As is the case with many things on the internet, what began as simply goofing around quickly devolved into something very profane and very offensive. Wait, is this even Sparkle safe to Sites play? Soon inspired a variety of imitators looking to make their own twisted interpretations of the once family friendly character. This heinous new alter Wait, ego of what? Mac tonight. The peanut butter jelly time banana is inspired by the Mac tonight moon? From the 80s? Sponsored, or which was inspired by <laughs> a crooner song, which is inspired by a play about a serial killer. Sites soon inspired a variety of imitators looking to make their own twisted interpretations of the once family-friendly character. 
This heinous new alter ego of Mac Tonight came to be known by a different moniker, Moon Man, a name that would live on in infamy. It started with a few racially insensitive chants and quickly escalated to full-blown song covers advocating for crimes against humanity. Some of these songs were so hideously obscene that they have since been expunged from all but the grittiest corners of the web. What is this fucking As video? As grew in notoriety, so too did the scope of its contributors. In 2008, several of the most prolific Moon Man posters would form a faction known as the Moon Crew, a collection of users dedicated to the advancement of their new lunar overlord. Together, they would help establish a sophisticated lore around the character which was unofficially referred to as the Mooniverse. In the following months, the Moon crew would amass dozens of members who made themselves known as a new Bro, humanity was a mistake platform. for real. Moon Man sites were being created with such abundance that they began to draw the attention of outside forces. During this time, many of the most popular Moon Man edits would be frequently re-uploaded to YouTube, a platform with far stricter rules than YTMND. Due to the extremely vulgar content of the genre, most of the YouTube uploads wouldn't last long before getting flagged and removed for community guidelines violations. But despite their short lifespans, the sheer amount of traffic on YouTube meant that it was the most visible place for the public to discover the shocking fate of the fast food legend. Evidently, McDonald's and AT&T must have received some complaints over the meme, with McDonald's issuing copyright strikes and AT&T banning oh, they the took term it down? Moon Man from their text-to-speech service. Even YTMND attempted to ban the I'm cutting this video short, bro. <laughs> what a bust. <laughs> what a bust of a video. My God. What a bust of a video. Literally took forever to get there. <laughs> it's not even over. Keep watching. Do you think I stopped it because I thought it was over? That could have been... That could have been like literally one tenth the length and gotten all the same information. Unless there's a, a twist ending, that was bad. <laughs> they didn't say it was about McDonald's market. It wasn't it wasn't about it was about just the one fucking moon man thing. <laughs> the twist was more racism? That's good. Let's see what else we got. I need a I need a better video than that. Um let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. We decided to erase the three pointer. It's kind of interesting. Uh, turning a sphere outside in Lego GTA cement truck theory. <laughs> I mean that, how long is that? Bitch, my name is Shane the goat and I'll just be playing Lego GTA today. I'm going to be conducting a theory on the cement trucks in Lego GTA. Let's just steal this old woman's this vehicle so she could be stranded. I would be running her over. As you guys know, when I play this game, I often see cement trucks. But there's no real reason for a cement truck to be under Look, there's one right now. Let's go look. Let's go look. Yeah, they'll be fine. You guys will be sh shocked. As you guys can see, the cement truck drivers often just stare with a blank face. And they're very impatient. See, they run you over. They try to kill you. They, they don't want you to see. They don't want you to see. And if you look in the back of their truck, they don't even have cement. They don't even have cement. Look, there's another one. What are they plotting? What are they plotting? There's a in Lego city? GTA? I've never even heard of this. There's another one. Look. Look, it's the same driver. It's the same driver. 
am I in a simulation? <laughs> it's the same driver. Look, I bet he'll run me over because they're all impatient. Look, 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 look. He should be running me over. He just ran me over again, guys. I just got ran over again, guys. I'm in a simulation. Look, this one doesn't even have anything in the back. And, and as you guys can see, if you go to the map, all the semen trucks are in this area. Why does he keep saying semen trucks? <laughs> I did learn a lot from that, though. I learned there's a Lego GTA. Um. Uh, okay. Let's see. Liminal spaces. Uh, open. A oh, this is an amazing video, but I've already seen it. This video rules. If you haven't seen it, it's really good. Um. Shipwreck teens build a city to survive. It's kind of interesting. Um, why button mashing doesn't work? Oh, no. Is war over? <laughs> when did this come out? <laughs> Violence. <laughs> I don't know what your answer is, but fucking no. <laughs> No. Uh, Wall Street bets. In search of a flat Earth. Philanthropy scam. This is a this is a scam. Yeah, it is a scam. The system where you know a few people get a vast majority of the wealth and then dole out small percentages as philanthropy. That's also tax advantaged. Is not a great way to solve our problems. Sphere of it. Harry Potter by Sean. Um, I don't need the Gex jokes explained. Um, calculate your pet's HP. <laughs> is he going to hurt an animal in this? I don't want to watch that. <laughs> Uh, how long is it? Is life quantifiable? Every breath, every beat of a heart? Do they count as tallies etched tirelessly into the stone of our existence until one day that stone is returned to dust? Is there yes. a number, an algorithm underlying the spark of life? And if given the chance to know the arcane secrets of that algorithm, would you use that power for good? Or would you use it to calculate your pet's HP? Because that's what I would do. <laughs> Hit points. What are they? And how do they become the standard unit of life in nearly every game? It all started with war games. Tabletop games that involve a lot of little miniature military forces fighting on a battlefield. Back in the 19... It is crazy we call them hit points. I just realized that. Why wouldn't you just call it health? Hit points. Feels weird. In the 1920s, the Naval War College created an early form of this in order to help evaluate battles before actually fighting them. They had a stat called Life, which was determined by how many 14-inch shell hits a vessel could take. So that's what a hit point is. How many 14-inch shells it would take to kill you. Every living creature is one hit point. The end. <laughs> <laughs> but that isn't our current understanding of HP. That came when war games shrank in scope and started to become more fantasy oriented. In older games, you would roll dice and then your troops would either survive or they would die. You had large swaths of nameless troops, so you could do this without feeling any remorse over their deaths. Haha, <laughs> war. But when these games stopped playing with hundreds of troops and instead focused on a few main characters, players realized they didn't want their characters to die, so the hit point was born. Your character could survive X number of bad rolls before throwing them in the garbage. So really, the hit point wasn't made to quantify how easy something is to kill. It was born from compassion and wanting to see your characters grow and thrive and then also to figure out how easy they were to kill. We've had some semblance of <laughs> HP for nearly a century, but we haven't updated our real-world understanding of what one hit point looks like. So I'll be doing that 
specifically so you can quantify your pet's HP. A little disclaimer Great. up front, I am not giving you this algorithm so you can battle your pets. Animal abuse is wrong. And if you needed me to tell you that, I'm glad I told you that. <laughs> I'm also not teaching you how to calculate human HP because that power is too great to wield. And it could easily be used for evil by some of the most wicked forces on Earth, like health insurance companies. <laughs> no, I am teaching you to calculate your pet's HP as a fun bonding exercise between you and your animal. Or in case you happen to be at a house party where you don't know anyone HP. but the hosts have a dog and so instead of just sitting in the corner pretending to text people, you can spend your time calculating that dog's <laughs> HP, which is a way more normal thing to don't do in do a that. social situation. Don't do that. Now it is time for the research. How are we going to effectively calculate any pet's HP? Luckily, there are plenty of games that cover pretty much every type of pet that you could possibly have, but I'll be using Pokemon as the main pet HP analog because it is Pokemon. literally about having lots and lots of pets that you can love and cherish, and I'm ignoring all the other stuff. And that brings us to and our first kill, criteria, and type. According to the National Pet Owners Survey, here are the most common types of pets found in U.S. households. I appreciate that they have included a category called small animals, as if that means fucking anything. Well, like so we're swirl. changing some things. The standards are still there. Dog, cat, fish, and all aquatic creatures. Reptile, bird, equine. Small animal is becoming small mammal for things like ferrets and rabbits. We're also including bug because I love bugs. And if you have bugs in your house and you make the conscious decision to want those bugs in your house, they aren't pests, they're pets. Amphibian for the frog people. Farm animals covers any livestock that don't immediately fit into the other categories. Originally, I thought about classifying like these quadrupedal animals as different sorts of dog. Chunky dog, milky dog, <laughs> horny dog. But farm animal encompasses them a little bit better. I am still keeping those names, though. <laughs> we also have a category I call exotic, which encompasses all of the animals you see in Instagram influencer pics that make you say, hmm, I don't know if you should own that thing. This can go from monkeys to bats to hyenas, which, according to this incredibly reliable website, I could technically own in New York due oh. to a loophole. Also, Millennials and Gen Z often live in tiny, no-pet apartments and don't get paid Sag. enough to support a decent standard of living for themselves, let alone a pet. So they'll often turn to plants in order to feel the joy that comes from nurturing a living thing in our rapidly decaying ecosystem. <sighs> So I'm extending pet status to plants, so that way you too can do this HP calculation. <laughs> because, God, we all need a distraction sometimes. <laughs> By building a set of pet types, we are able to assign <laughs> HP ranges to each of them by finding the lowest base HP and the highest max HP of each type. The absolute extremes of this scale are Shedinja, with a base HP of 1, and Waylord, with a max HP of 544. Now, both of these would be pretty wild to have as pets, considering one is the shell left behind after a cicada molts, and the other is a fucking whale. But that's why they're the extremes, and that's why we are not done with our equation yet. We might know the full HP range of a dog, but what is the HP range of your dog? I thought for a moment about having size be the next criteria, because you might think that the larger the animal, the more HP it would have. Generally true. That's actually not true. In fact, the Pokemon with the highest base HP is Blissey, this strange little egg woman. And Onyx, an enormous rock snake, has one of the lowest base HPs of all Pokemon. Really? This confused me, so I had to go back to the original popularizer has less of HP, HP than Snow Dungeons and Dragons. And it was there that I realized what truly affects your HP value. Your value is not defined by the size or shape of your body. It's about what you do with the body you're given. It's all about class, as in what standard gaming class Why does your pet so fall weak? into. Every class has different HP ranges based on what they are expected to do. Barbarians are out in the front lines, so they tend to have a lot more HP than a rogue who is slinking around in the back. I've decided that the classes that make the most sense for pets are Barbarian, Ranger, Paladin, Cleric, and Rogue. 
I haven't included any classes like Sorcerer, because if you have a magical Doesn't pet, make any sense. what are you doing here? Go cast spells with your turtle. These class distinctions separate your pet's HP range into 10 equal portions. If your pet is a rogue, you get the first six. If your pet is a barbarian, you're anywhere from five to 10. Your pet's personality will determine what class they fall into. Your pet <laughs> is a rogue if they are rakish, mischievous, and spry. Cats tend to come to mind for the rogue category simply because they are always up in shit that they should not be up in. Your pet is a cleric if they are kind, reserved, and healing. A rabbit that hops onto your lap after a rough day of work and makes you forget all your worries is 100% cleric. Your pet is a paladin if it is loyal, resourceful, and honestly tries a little bit what too hard. In the middle, Does your what zucchini plant parts? produce too many zucchinis? Yeah, AKA, a BuzzFeed quiz any for my amount pet. of zucchinis? It's a paladin. Your pet is a ranger if they are self-sufficient, aloof, and kind of do their own thing. Ask yourself, am I holding my pet rat back from their true ambitions? The answer is always yes, and your rat is a ranger. And finally, your pet is a barbarian if they are boorish, brazen, and courageous to a fault. Does your dog dig under the fence so it can jump into your neighbor's pool? Your dog is Marmaduke. It is also a barbarian. Your pet can have a combination of many of these traits, but it's up to you to decide which traits are most dominant. Now that we have your pet's type and class designated, we need to get into the nitty gritty of their exact HP, which means finding your pet's level. In order to do this, you must observe your pet in a scientific manner. So I reached out to a field biologist. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a wildlife biologist. I contacted Olivia after she responded to my totally normal Twitter request with this dope ass picture. I figured that if anyone knew how to calculate the hit points of an animal, it would be someone holding a huge bird like it was a torch. Have you ever found the hit points of any of the animals you've been researching? I've never been involved in any sort of study where that was something that we looked at. So no. Okay. But there are probably plenty of studies about hit points with animals. Probably. Though she didn't have experience with my specific question, I knew she would have some useful advice for observing animals in their natural habitat. When you're observing an animal, how much interaction should you have with it? None. None at all. None. You have to sit in like a blind or a tent of some sort where you're hidden or you look like part of the environment. You could wear a ghillie suit. People oh. have also done that. How long of a period are you observing that animal for? It depends on how much time and resources you have, obviously. There have been scientists that have been observing the same hawk for like 20 years in a row. So if I am trying to <laughs> perfectly know my pet's uh -huh. HP, I should be observing it for multiple years. Yes. <laughs> cool. How do you take notes when you're observing an animal? Right, so I actually, can I send you I'm something? Yes, so yes, confidently. This is like this exactly is she knows what I was to. looking for. Olivia had sent me an animal behavior data sheet, which I could use as a template for observing and recording a pet's behavior. But some of these behaviors wouldn't make sense when observing your pet on a random day. We ended up developing a new sheet that had standard behaviors and class specific behaviors that had different <laughs> weights associated with them. You observe your pet for X number of hours, tally up all the behaviors they did over the course of those hours, and then divide the weighted total by X to give you your pet's level. The logic behind this is that a higher level pet is more likely to do more intense and class specific behaviors. Then you plug that level into this algorithm and you get your pet's HP. It may seem challenging, but science shouldn't be easy. It should be correct. This is probably the hardest scientific work you've ever had to do. It really is. Yeah. With these tips in mind, I welcome you into my home. In order to test these calculations, I need a test subject. So I'm using my roommate's cat, Zuko. He lives in my apartment, but he doesn't pay rent, and he eats my bagels if I leave them unattended. As I mentioned previously, finding your pet's HP Zuko. can be a fun bonding exercise. And in this case, I've been dealing with this small bastard's antics for so long, I need to remind myself why he's here by quantifying his value. The first step is easy. He is a cat. That puts him in the cat category. Okay. Step two, we gotta give Zuko a class. As I mentioned previously, cats are often rogues, but I don't think that fits Zuko considering he is the least stealthy creature I know. His meow sounds like he's been smoking two packs a day for the past 40 years. 
<laughs> and every time he does manage to sneak into his food cabinet, that is not he lets a pleasant me know meow. immediately. Just wanted to check in on <laughs> what's going on up here in the cat cabinet where we keep all of the food for the cat. <laughs> he is loud, stubborn, and not afraid to make terrible decisions in plain view of me. And that makes this guy a barbarian. Okay. But now it is time to observe Zuko to find his level. As per Olivia's instructions, I must observe him for several years without any interaction. After explaining why I needed it, my time off request was denied. So instead, I ate some bodega sushi in order to induce illness, and I took a sick day. <clears throat> This is the hard part, because it's going to require me to observe Zuko as he goes about his daily business without him noticing that I am here at all. I assumed my position, and I waited for the interesting <laughs> behavior to start. <laughs> Hello, Zuko. Not only was this terribly boring, but I was beginning to fear <laughs> that Zuko was not as strong as I had hoped. Do something! <laughs> Please! But then I realized there was an exploit in my system. Though Olivia, a scientist, said that you should keep your interferences to a minimum, I'm not a scientist. I'm a gamer. And I began what is known mm. as power leveling. I had mm. to get Zuko as many experience points as I could before my roommate got home and asked me what I was doing. <laughs> Holy Over shit, he's grinding! Day, Zuko averaged he's grinding! ...behavioral experience points per hour, although those behaviors were somewhat coerced by me. I know he's that I power my leveling. system by interacting with Zuko, but if it makes my pet happier, and it makes him less of a weak-ass scrub, why wouldn't I game the so win -win. system? I had also noticed that Zuko and I had grown closer. Our support level had increased to at least a B. I no longer saw him as a freeloader who sometimes throws up in my bed. I saw him as a companion who sometimes throws up in my bed. When I felt lonely in my empty apartment, he was there for me. When my stomach ached <laughs> from the bodega sushi, he purred at just the right frequency to ease my pain. When I was worried he was going to be underleveled, he soothed my anxieties with his heavenly voice. And all this time I had spent trying to calculate his HP, I hadn't realized he was replenishing mine. So here is Zuko, Barbarian class, level 63. I love him with all my heart, and he loves me just the same. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the concept for that video, but I gotta be honest, BD, uh, G is very charming. And it's a good video. And I'm going to bring my pet in here to see what level she is. Maya. A sweet, sweet dog. Mwah, 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 mwah. What's your HP, huh? What's your HP, Maya? Do you need to grind? I don't want BDG to have a higher level pet than me. That would make me sad. We gotta grind, huh? Do you want a little... I guess you don't want a pecan, huh? Do you want a carrot? Mm, it's kind of an old carrot. You don't want any of the food around here. Nom, 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 nom. Give her a factor meal. <laughs> yeah? I wish. I pray to God every day. That factor would release a brand new dog version of their food that I could get for Maya so she could enjoy it as much as me. But unfortunately, it's humans only right now. What's her class? She's a cleric, obviously, based on his his criteria. Although she's probably pretty low level on account of the fact that she's a huge puss. <laughs> and she's scared of everything. 
She's probably pretty low level. Everything scares her. High five. High five. Throw on a wall. High five. <laughs> you like her band? Oh, you can't see her bandana. Look at her bandana. She looks cute. High five. <laughs> that was the daintiest high five ever. Come on, put a little force into it. I think she's nervous, you know? All right, one more. High five. Maya, high five. <laughs> she, she looks fucking... <laughs> All right. I mean, one more. Let's try one more time. Come on. It's okay. High five. Hi. Hi, good girl. Hi. High five. <laughs> good girl. Good girl. All right, you get it. Wow, you're so smart. I know. Look at those fuckers. Why is she so depressed? Do you guys take all your jokes from slime or just some of them? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's like, do you have a book where you just write down jokes that slime already invented and then just copy them? Like copy paste? <laughs> or I don't. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm going to let her out one second. All right. Well, I think that, well, how long is the sphere? Everyone's kind of recommending the sphere. The sphere, the sphere, the sphere. What particularly is interesting about the sphere? The sphere. Turning a sphere outside in. It's 23 minutes long. Yeah, I don't know about that one, chief. <laughs> I don't know about that one, chief. No, no, no. And I think it's a bait anyway. Everyone's fucking Pepe laughing like it's actually just a bait and I'm going to hate it. <laughs> I don't know about that one, chief. Um, um, <laughs> the Summit Ice commercial. <laughs> this is <laughs> uh, that's the Nathan for you one, right? Oh yeah. Wait, what is this one? Death of a game. Harry Potter Wizards Unite. That was an actual game. How long is this? This video is sponsored by Migrant. Mm. I'm looking for a short banger. I'm looking for a short banger. The real reason you like MILF so much? <laughs> Let's just have six check marks. <laughs> if I don't surf, he doesn't eat. Classic. Who got rich off the war in Afghanistan? Interesting. I like I like this guy a lot, this creator, but might be a little too serious for the end of the night goofies. Um hmm. Why war will never be seen again? I'm actually reading a book on this. I just got a book by a retired general about sort of some of the things that will be likely if there's a future war. It's very interesting so far. Um, and scary. Uh, lawsuits that actually weren't ridiculous. Yeah, the hot coffee lawsuit was not ridiculous. True. MMO economies and hyperinflation. This could actually be super interesting. But I don't know if I'm in the mood right now. This does seem really interesting. How long MMOs suffer from a strange... Are oh, we going to watch this? If it's interesting. Problem. At least in a real world economic sense. Everybody is printing money all the time.
for years, every massive multiplayer game has struggled with this. And, as any old-school MMO player will tell you, the results were as devastating as they often were hilarious. But of late, games have stolen a very real-world economic solution. We've covered this a bit before, but basically every time you kill a monster in an MMO, it drops money, or a piece of loot that a vendor yeah. can conveniently convert Gold out of money nowhere. for you. This money doesn't come from anywhere. There's not a limited supply of it at all. Rather, it's just magically created every time you win a fight. And with hundreds of thousands of players killing monsters 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, that's a lot of money being constantly added. Don't they invent, I mean, like, games invent, like, these big money sinks to take money out of the economy. Like, things you can only buy from stores that are outrageously expensive that you have to buy, and then it, that's like... To the economy. Imagine what this would do to a real-world economy. Imagine if, rather than your central bank having the exclusive right to print money and keeping careful tabs on how much money is out there, so, everybody- Not that careful. <laughs> not that- I mean, When does this video come out? 2016? Okay. Careful. More careful back then than there. It was just printing money all the time. You would hit hyperinflation pretty fast. The value of the currency would plummet, and a loaf of bread that cost $5 one day would cost 50 the next week, and then 5000 and then people would just stop accepting money for bread altogether. Your currency would be, effectively, worthless. And that is exactly what happens in most MMOs. In Asheron's Call, the in-game currency became so inflated that shards were used as money. In Diablo 2, Stones of Jordan rapidly replaced gold. And in Gaia Online, the currency became so worthless that the company started offering to donate $250 to charity every time the players threw away 15 trillion gold. <laughs> players just abandoned the designated currency and... We should try that in America. <laughs> we should try that in America, dude. If Bezos lights $4 billion on fire, I will... <laughs> I'll give 200 bucks to charity. That's my solemn vow. I promise to do that. I will do it. If I can get confirmation that one of these billionaires lights $4 billion on fire, I will... ...chose a different, more restricted currency because they could no longer trust the initial game currency to retain any value at all. And this has a devastating impact on these games. It makes the game less approachable for new players. It means that returning players come back to a now worthless bank account. It makes it harder for players to exchange goods, and in some poorly supported MMOs, it's even rendered the in-game auction house unusable. So, of course, there were all sorts of ways we always used to try to design around this. We would put money sinks in the game. Things yeah. like auction house fees, vendor-only consumable items that were practically necessary to play, guild dues, or yeah, even yeah, property yeah, yeah. tax for owning in-game real estate. Those sinks were designed to remove currency from the game. When you paid for any of those items or services, the money you paid with simply vanished, which theoretically would have a deflation area. So this is a solution that I thought was there, but there's more of this video. It sounds like they have a better solution now, which I'm kind of interested in. But as we all know, when it comes to MMO players, there is practically no money sink you can build that's going to exceed how much people are willing to grind. And even <laughs> if you could get close, well, that could hurt your economy too. And honestly, it might make your game less engaging to play if the player feels like they're spending all of their time just paying fees. True. It's not really why we play games. But it's true. If you're paying actual real money every month so you can log on and grind to earn fake money to pay your in-game bills. <laughs> That's a little dystopian. Although people basically do that now. Lately, it seems like designers have discovered another solution. A reserve currency. In the real world, almost every nation holds on to a bunch of currency from other countries to serve as a reserve currency. This reserve currency is used for international transactions, but far more importantly to us, it's used to anchor the local currency. Because after all, if you have $500 billion in the bank and you tell everybody that they can trade 50 of your currency for one US dollar, well then the least your currency is worth is two cents. It can't go below that so long as you've got some of your reserve currency left. If your currency starts to inflate, then people start to trade in your local money for the reserve currency, effectively creating a floor for what your currency is worth, so long as you still have a supply of the reserve currency. So how does this work in MMOs? Well, of late, many MMOs have started to allow players to buy things of real-world value with in-game currency, like Plex in EVE Online. 
many of the free-to-play MMOs have gone one step even further and let players buy their microtransaction currency, the currency that has to be bought with real money, from mm. other players for currency earned in-game. By tying the in-game currency to real-world currency, which has real value, the in-game currency now can't lose all of its value. But that alone didn't end up being enough to prevent hyperinflation in a lot of these games. So, two other aspects, somewhat lifted from how real-world reserve currencies work, were put into place in order to overcome the infinite money printing that MMOs naturally engage in. The first kind of is illiquidity. In the real world, reserve currencies can't really be traded among the local populace. Like, if you go to China, even though the Chinese keep huge amounts of U.S. dollars yeah, as reserve currency, you can't really simply trade U.S. dollars for things on the street. You usually need to convert your money into yuan first. And while clearly this is not 100% true in the real world, because the real world basically breaks every rule at some point, you nice. can make it 100% true in games, because you set the rules of that world. You can prevent players from trading the purchased currency. Players can convert their robots. earned currency to purchased currency, but that currency can't then be traded to players except by converting it back to earned currency through the same system. The purchased currency can only ever be spent. You know what? This would actually probably be easier to follow if I named these currencies and gave some examples or something. So, let's call the currency you earn in-game by killing monsters and stuff silver pieces. And the currency that you've got to pay real money for? Those are diamonds. In our hypothetical game, you can use the game's currency exchange to, let's say, pay 10,000 silver pieces to buy 100 diamonds. Nice. Once you've done that, you either have to spend those 100 diamonds in the in-game store, thereby permanently removing those diamonds from the economy, or you can just sell the diamonds to somebody else for 10,000 silver to get your money back. You can't ever use diamonds to buy things from players. Like, you can't offer to buy somebody's epic sword of awesomeness using your newly acquired diamonds. Because if you could do that, diamonds would just become the new currency, and people would abandon silver entirely. But, but why because even there's swap a whole the host of items that you can't buy with diamonds, even players with oh, a lot right. of money to spend on the game still need to earn that in-game silver, and thus will trade their diamonds for it. In our real-world analog, buying something with diamonds is basically like buying something from a foreign market. That money leaves the economy, but in return you get a good or a service that you couldn't purchase locally. But clearly, in this scenario, if silver is added to the world faster than diamonds, the price of silver to diamonds will inflate. Creating a reserve currency might help you avoid the problem of silver becoming totally worthless, but you haven't yet prevented crippling inflation. <laughs> to do that, you need to take one more step, and that is setting a maximum limit on how much a diamond can cost. Back when we used the gold standard in the real world, which we talked about a little bit in this extra history series on paper money, she and was gold was used there. as I'm... the reserve currency internationally, nations would just set a fixed price for how much an ounce of gold was worth. They would say, all right, the government says you can always trade 23 U.S. dollars for an ounce of gold. We did this until Nixon in about 1971. Uh, you used to be able to uh, turn your dollars into gold, and it, you know. Um, and then we went off that system, and a lot of things. <laughs> uh, if you look at a lot of charts, uh, basically macroeconomic charts, Everything starts spiking up in 1971. And all of a sudden, the very least a dollar could be worth, or put another way, the most it could inflate to, is 1 23rd of an ounce of gold. Holy shit, people who invented money need to touch grass. <laughs> Now, in the real world, there's all sorts of problems and complications with this that involve the limit on the gold supply and how hard it is to respond to economic shocks when you've declared your currency worth a certain amount of gold, but we don't have to deal with any of that in games. And this form of currency reserve was really, really good at one thing, keeping inflation down. Now, because money is still being perpetually printed in your game, you are still going to need money sinks. And now, there's two events. The one in the 30s with FDR where he got us off the official gold standard and I think I think at the time actually banned gold. Like the government started confiscating gold um, in the 30s uh, was the first wave. But the Nixon one was where you could no longer convert your U.S. dollars officially through the government into gold, which they were still honoring until that point. 
And even with those, because there are items that simply can't be bought with diamonds, some inflation is going to occur. But with these systems in place, instead of hitting hyperinflation, you'll get something much closer to the rational real world inflation that comes with an expanding economy. And while there are a million other complexities with reserve currencies that I've not been able to even scratch the surface of in this 10 minute video, and because there's other weirdness with MMOs that throws a bit of a wrench into the whole thing, this stuff isn't a magic bullet. It's not a perfect solution, but by stealing one of the quintessential economic tools that makes our real world run, we are one huge step closer to solving one of the oldest problems in MMO design. See you next time. Interesting video. I, you know, I think maybe it's a complex topic and he tried to explain it really quickly and got a little confusing. I, I didn't I didn't see the clear solution there, but it was interesting. Um I like the idea of um Are you their channel. I wonder if there's anything else that's really amazing. Mm. That's a lot of history stuff, huh? I thought it was mostly game stuff. Um, I don't want to watch Sphere. And so I'm not going to. Maybe I'll watch it next time. I'm not going to watch it now. <laughs> Uh, the Evergreen Rhyme game. These are the best warriors who ever lived. Hey, 42 here. I don't know if I want to watch this whole thing. Shit, I want to watch part of this. But it seems kind of pog. They should put the glamour eye in this. How about we watch the beginning, see if it's good. On the island of Sicily, you will find a gravestone. It reads, Flamma Secutor, Lived 30 years, fought 34 times, won 21 times, fought to a draw 9 times, a Syrian by nationality. You might not know it, but you are looking at the gravestone. Dual wielding the daggers? The greatest gladiator who ever lived. Flamma, which means flame, was a soldier in the Syrian army who was captured by the Romans, sold into slavery, and tossed into the gladiator arena. But it was here that he would find his calling. Living for the fight. He was a dual dagger wielding gladiator named Flame. <laughs> was he a 14 year old on Xbox? <laughs> Could you hear his fucking parents yelling at him in the background? Flammer fought as a secutor, which means he wore a big metal helmet, wielded a Roman gladius, a legendary Roman short sword against the Retiaris, an incredibly agile, highly skilled opponent armed with a trident and a net. The Retiaris, meaning net man, was styled after a the fisherman. Net man. Using his weighted net and trident, he would trap his opponents and skewer them alive. Bro, I bet it was so embarrassing when you threw the net and just missed by a mile. <laughs> and then all you've got left is the shitty trident. <laughs> and everyone's watching, dude, and you're like, he's coming. Huh! And it just fucking missed. <laughs> Man, the sinking feeling in your fucking gut when that missed. Whew, I'm dead for sure. Alternatively, he would use his net to entangle his opponent's weapon. But Flammer, as a secutor, meaning pursuer, would hunt his opponent down like a sword-wielding Mike Tyson. And dodging his net in the long reach of his trident, rip him to pieces with his gladius. Flammer was so successful and talented in the arena that he quickly became a celebrity and the face of a Roman coin. But they put him on a coin? most extraordinarily, he received the Rudis, a wooden sparring sword that meant he had won his freedom. Wow. Not once, but four times. Well, does not And each time, he turned it down. Apparently, retirement from this brutal and often fatal sport wasn't quite his thing. Eat your heart out, Russell Crowe. Interestingly, seeing that recent studies have suggested gladiators were mostly vegetarians, he may also have been the toughest vegetarian of all time. <laughs> <laughs>
There have been countless warriors throughout history, but what makes one truly great Since and Ron's body? legendary status? That's tough. Is it his fighting prowess, his bravery, what he used his skills to accomplish? Or it may simply be someone who regularly confronts death and is a master of his form of fighting. Someone whose accomplishments stand out even to this day. There has been Leonidas I of Sparta, the legendary Spartan king who led 300 Spartans against Xerxes. Euphay, who fought in 126 battles and never lost. Ooh. Prince Rupert of the Rhine, who was so gifted in battle, his enemies believed he possessed supernatural abilities. <laughs> or Simon... I mean, he must have been good, because if you have a mustache like that and people still call you a great warrior... <laughs> that, that's impressive. I mean, that... You have to be above and beyond. That's Ryan, a hurdle that's tough. He was so though. gifted in battle, his enemies believed he possessed supernatural abilities. Or Simon Bolivar, who during his campaigns rode 123,000 kilometers, more than Hannibal, Napoleon, and Alexander the Great. Or there is the bravery of the Anzac fighting troops that led German commander Erwin Rommel to say, if I had to take hell, I would use the Australians to take it and the New Zealanders to hold it. But Australians. from all these incredible warriors, there are some person to get a so quote from, but take what you can get. stand out amongst the rest. <laughs> Mongolia has been the birthplace of some of the most savage and gifted warlords the world has ever known. The Mongolian Empire to this day stands as the largest contiguous empire in history, largely due to the unstoppable aggression of Genghis Khan. Mongolians have historically been unmatched archers and horsemen, and could rival far more technologically advanced foes. That's why when a woman emerges from amongst their hordes and starts handing them their arses, it's time to take notice. Kutulun was a 13th century Mongolian warrior princess. She was a great granddaughter to Genghis Khan, niece of Kublai Khan, and the favorite child of Kaidu, the ruler of Changati Khanate, consisting of Xinjiang and Central Asia and she was one he regularly sought out for advice and counsel. Like most Mongolian warriors, she was adept at horse riding and archery, and she would often that ride was their side go -to. by side with her father in battle, taking captives on horseback as she raided enemy towns. But it wasn't this that made Kutulun stand out. It was something far more unique. You see, alongside being able to fire an arrow through your head whilst hanging off the side of a horse saddle, Mongolian warriors were also fearsome wrestlers, and she was, perhaps, the best of them all. Kutulun would often dress in men's outfits and challenge enormous warriors to a match. She would always win. When her father attempted to marry her off, a fiery and headstrong Kutulun refused, telling her father she would not marry any man who could not best her in wrestling. Amused at his daughter's defiant spirit, Kaidu set up a simple competition. If you could defeat Kutulun, you could marry her. <laughs> if you failed, you had to- That's a- that's gonna get your daughter killed. She can't fight infinite number of people. Give her 100 horses. Men came from all corners of Mongolia to face her in combat, and her father watched as her would-be suitors faced her one by one. But by the end of the competition- It's gotta be Kutulun, a myth remained unmarried and had 10,000 more horses. That's ridiculous. To That's stupid. She beat 10,000 people. They lined up and she, she beat up 10,000 people. No, I don't think that's real, dude. <laughs> Nay, I'll let you do the maths on that one. One such fight was recorded by none other than the legendary traveler Marco Polo himself. He wrote that a wealthy, handsome, and powerful. No, no, no built you guys don't understand. The math is different in Mongolia. No, 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 you guys don't understand. He had healthy. The math is different in Mongolia. You don't understand. Huge body of you guys are all wrong. And everyone Sorry. around <laughs> whispered that this was sure to be the husband of Kutulun. When word got around that the fight was to begin, a huge crowd, which included Polo himself, gathered to watch. The combatants locked arms, <laughs> with the prince immediately demonstrating that he was far more than any ordinary opponent. With the crowd of spectators beside themselves with excitement, I took bath in Mongolia and with the game. Yeah, exactly. It's different. I've, I've studied abroad. I know Mongolia math. It's a little different. Had against Cthulhu before. When you include then, horses, you have to carry the one. You know what I'm saying? Unexpected happened. Without warning, Cthulhu shifted her positioning, 
gains the leverage she needed and viciously slams the prince to the ground, silencing both the prince and the once excited crowd. She beat the shit out of a lot the of people in this was this over, store. and Cthulhu Dory. was victorious. Although there are conflicting reports of Cthulhu's love life, there are no official records of her ever getting married, and all that is clear is that through her legendary wrestling, fighting, skill There's and no bravery, official records of any she of this. brought so much respect and wealth to the family that her father wanted her to be the next Khan. And when her father died, Mongolian tradition made clear I that can his fix her. heir <laughs> wouldn't actually be his son, but rather his strongest no prizes for guessing who that was. Nobody knows what happened to Cthulhun past this point. It is unclear how she died. And it is clear that, for some reason, she never came to rule. But there is one thing apparent in her story. There's never been a warrior quite like her. Now, everyone knows the cliche of the lone samurai warrior. The one who wanders Japan, putting enemies down left, right, and center, all yeah. while seemingly having no real purpose. Finally, the, the glamour I gets included. Films, comics, and cartoons. But what if I was to tell you that there was a real guy who was just like this, and he's probably the sole reason that the cliche exists. Miyamoto Mosasi was a samurai ronin. And he wrote many books about his good friend, the Glamorai, a powerful warrior dressed head to toe in Gucci clothing. <laughs> oh, this is Miyamoto. Under Japan in the 16th and 17th centuries, killing the most dangerous enemies he could find. So legendary was his fighting ability that even now he is considered by many to be the Kensei or Sword Saint of all Japan. Sword Saint Ishii. Born in the Harima province, Mosasi was trained in the art of the sword by his father, as well as the family art of the Jite, an ancient Japanese police weapon. He was soon moved to a Buddhist monastery where he learned Buddhism that he would later return to in his life. He was bold and talented, and aged only 13, he faced his first opponent. Arima Kihei was a swordsman who encountered Musashi along the banks of the Saho River. Musashi, eager to test himself, charged Kihei and struck him with his cane and challenged him to a duel. Kihei responded with a slash of his sword, but by now Musashi was too close and tackled the man to the floor, where he then proceeded to beat him to death with 14 <laughs> to 15 blows. What? His cane. After this, Musashi traveled around Japan, engaging as a 13 year old, he beat a man to death, known to many as the Musha Shogyo, meaning Samurai Warrior's Quest. He also fought in the famous Battle of Sekigahara, where some have suggested he refused to fight as his lord's vassal, which is perhaps the moment he became a true ronin, a masterless samurai. And it was here that some of his most legendary duels began. He went on to gain a reputation as a master swordsman and was awarded the title Unrivaled Under Heaven by Shogun Ashikaga oh, Yoshiaki. That's a cool this title. This is why when Masasi challenged Yoshioko Sijoro, the master of the Yoshioka fighting school, to a duel, he immediately accepted. But Masasi was a far more cunning opponent than he'd anticipated. Using the customs of the day to his advantage, Masasi deliberately arrived late to the duel enraging Seijuro and causing him to lose his composure. When the duel began, Musashi struck swiftly, striking his angry opponent on the left shoulder, knocking him out and crippling his left arm. With leadership of the school now passing on to Yoshioka Denshichiro, an equally deadly swordsman, Musashi was immediately challenged to a duel in order to avenge his defeated master oh, and wow. restore honor to the school. Surprised Musashi eagerly accepted. Taking place in Kyoto, Denshichiro arrived wielding a long staff reinforced with steel and prepared to kill the disrespectful Ronin. And he brought a staff, but isn't that kind of cheating? He hadn't learned from his former master's fate. Arriving late, Musashi once again threw his opponent into a rage. <laughs> and within minutes, Musashi. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe the guy's just late. You know what I'm saying? Maybe he's not like a fucking nine head genius calculating the way they. Maybe he's just fucking late. Maybe he just gets, he's just late to a lot of things. As he had taken advantage of his poor composure, disarmed him, and defeated him, outraging and disgracing the Ashiyoka family. Maybe he's a family. streamer. But it wouldn't end here. With leadership now falling to a 12-year-old boy named Yashioka 
about Matsuchiro, the school assembled a small <laughs> band of swordsmen, archers, and even musketeers. Please tell me he doesn't show up late and kill a 13-year-old boy. Please tell me he's done, all right? He beat the two teachers. And having challenged Musashi to another duel, waited for him to arrive late and end his life. But Musashi had done something completely unexpected. He had arrived early. <laughs> Hiding in nearby bushes, Musashi sprang into the middle of his opponent and ferociously attacked. Startled and inexperienced, Matsuchiro was almost immediately slain, and then Musashi escaped, defending himself against the archer's musket fire and the pursuing swordsmen the under incredible pressure. Musashi was forced to draw his second sword in order to survive. And I'm sorry, so just to reiterate what happened there, he showed up early to an agreed-upon duel Jumped out of a bush and tried to kill a 12-year-old. Is that... And didn't. <laughs> and didn't get it done. Just... He just tried to gank a child. Oh, he succeeded? I thought he said he got away. I thought he said he almost succeeded, but he didn't do it. Let's hear it again. And use it all against the archer who's immediately slain. Oh, Startled and inexperienced, Matsuchiro was almost immediately no, almost, slain. almost. And then Musashi escaped, defending himself he against the archer's him. musket fire and the pursuing swordsmen under incredible pressure. Musashi was forced to draw his second sword in order to survive and using it to successfully escape. It was here he invented his own unique style of samurai fighting called Niten Ichiryo, fighting with two swords. But... As shocking as these jewels... I mean, almost immediately could mean he was almost immediately slain. Because the guy jumped out of the thing. Or it could mean that he, he killed him relatively quickly. You'd have to... You'd have to... It would be weird to even say almost in that situation. Well, his most legendary duel was yet to come. After fighting over 60 mm -hmm. duels and never once tasting defeat, there was only one opponent who was thought to be an equal, if not superior, to Masasi. Sasaki Kajiro, the demon of the Western provinces. In an age where sword fighting was a really big deal, these were the two biggest deals of all. Sasaki was perhaps the most feared warrior of his time. He was composed, fearless, and the exact opposite of Musashi, respectful and an adherent of tradition. He wielded an Odachi, a huge Japanese sword, almost three feet long and much heavier than a normal sword. But despite this, Sasaki was said to wield it with unnatural speed and power. A duel was arranged on the island of Funajima, and standing on the beach with his hand resting on the hilt of his sword, Sasaki mm. waited for his opponent. Arriving late and by boat, Masasi swaggered up onto the beach with an unkempt, disrespectful appearance that outraged Sasaki's supporters. <laughs> but this wasn't Masasi's only plan. Sasaki drew his enormous nandachi, and prepared to fight, only to be met by Masasi's weapon. A bokken, a wooden sword that he had carved from the oar of his boat. Is he always and trying to enrage? Just as long as Sasaki's. <laughs> the fight began. Within seconds, Sasaki had struck. But when his blow came down, Masasi was not there. He was standing to his side. And all of a sudden, Sasaki felt Teleports himself behind you. stumble back then fall to the ground. He did not know what had occurred, but soon he was on his back, staring up at the blinding sun. Within seconds, he was dead. Musashi had brought down the Bokken onto his head, splitting his skull, and then smashed it into his chest, shattering his ribs. Some theories state that Musashi used the sun behind him to blind his opponent. Others state he had timed the duel so well that he used the tide to help him escape Sasaki's vengeful students. Either way, the result was clear. Masasi was still undefeated, and the greatest <laughs> swordsman 
the world had ever seen. Later in life, when he Apparently had done he died of people, cancer. Masasi retired to a That's cave, sad. embraced his Buddhist roots, and wrote the Book of the Five Rings, one of the most famous and influential books on strategy and philosophy ever written. And his techniques of taunting, mocking, and disrespecting his enemies so they'd become filled with rage and lose their composure were so successful that they were copied by the English at Agincourt mm. to defeat the French, and they were later adopted by fighters like Muhammad Ali and Conor McGregor. But so far, <laughs> these are individual warriors, all of whom are long dead. Is there a band of warriors still alive who to this day maintain a- Are you saying that Conor McGregor adapted the- <laughs> 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 I'm not I'm not so sure about that. Fierce and so unrivaled sure that. reputation. Yes. With an average height of five foot three, it would be easy to dismiss the Napoli's Gurkhas of being at a disadvantage. But you couldn't be more wrong. The Gurkhas have a legacy of fighting prowess, bravery, and exceptionalism that is equaled by very few in the modern world, and it is all summed up by their motto better to die than to be a coward. And their famous bladed dagger, the Kirky, which is said mm, to need I've to seen take this in, uh, The Gurkha story in began in the 19th century when border disputes between the kingdom- It's crazy they stole their weapon from Elden Ring. Isn't that wild? Uh... <laughs> ...of Nepal and the East India Company led to the British being so thoroughly impressed with the Gurkha's fighting ability that they did whatever they could to get them on their side. And they succeeded. They were soon incorporated into the British Indian Army proper. Today, they come under the banner of the Royal Gurkha Rifles and are, in every way, a contingent force of the British Army, as are the SAS and mispronounced. The oh, now you guys love Except his English, their numbers huh? Are recruited from now you guys love how he's handling English. British. Though Gurkha HQ is in Britain and they I, are. I, I'm looking up and I think this guy is like their literally just pointing from a wide variety never, of. Not even remotely diminished. Like, with them being awarded over one of these sources is a manga crosses, <laughs> the highest award of honor in britain and the gurkhas have perhaps more stories of exceptional bravery than any of i'm <laughs> i'm not sure this is fucking i'm not sure this is fact-based at all i think it's like a wide variety of random pieces of folklore i mean i like hearing about great warriors but i think this would have been this could have been different I wonder if they have like history's greatest single combat warriors. Hmm. <laughs> they do have the flame. Look at this guy. <laughs> that's, that's the only art they have? This feels like, man, this is like from Tumblr. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, ladies and gents. Um, I'm going to call it for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow, play some more Elden Ring, among other things. I have marketing money already done, so I don't really have to skip uh, tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to call it for now. You can finish the video on your own if you'd like to. <laughs> um, I'm done. I'm going to call it, and I'm going to go watch uh, some shows with Ari. I've been live for a long time today. And I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to do some more uh, Elden Ring and some more stuff. Marketing Monday on Monday. Already done. Ready to go. In the bag. Thanks for watching. That was fun. Sevens. Hope you enjoyed. Um... And what else did I want to say? Nothing. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for Lakers for inviting me to the GDQ thing. Hope hopefully it goes well. And uh, hope you guys had fun. Shout outs. Have a good one. Take care. Have a good weekend if I don't see you. And I'll be back uh, tomorrow probably for a little bit, and then Monday for sure for Marketing Monday. I'm gonna raid. Who am I gonna raid? So many people I could raid. 
I guess Linkus, right? No, is he? He's probably doing. He's probably doing. Um, I'll just raid Charlie. I'll just raid Moist. Go say hey to Charlie. He's playing uh, Kirby. Should be pretty fun. And, uh, yeah, have a good one. Appreciate it. Don't hurt your pets to find their HP. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.